Jung is not ambiguous at all when he says that the archetypes are the defining feature of the mind space. The archetypes are psychic. The templates of behavior of our psyche, our mind, correspond to the template behaviors of the world around us in order to generate these meaningful coincidences. The moment you say that, you are saying that the world around us too is psychic and it unfolds according to the same mental archetypes as our own mind. Why? Because our own mind is part of the world. Yeah. We are not separate from the world. So the implication is that there is only one psychic field spanning the entire world and everybody and everybody's minds. And it appears to us as physical in a way equivalent to how dreams appear to us as physical, even though dreams too are obviously psychic. They are manifestations of the personal or the collective unconscious. Welcome back to the transmission, my friends. As you hopefully know, one of my ever-present goals with this media vessel is to inject wonder into the everyday, turn up the volume on the mystery and meaning inherent to reality. Because believe me, I know life does not exactly seem to be brimming with vital quintessence when you're bogged down in the everyday, in the beige realities of modern life, or just when you're beset by the persistent winter gloom that I am currently enduring where I reside. But that said, I am determined to turn up said volume on the mystery responsibly in a way that stands up to logic and scrutiny. Not that I'm above playing with some dubious wonder nuggets from time to time, but I digress. Because when it comes to upping the wonder resolution in a responsible, rigorous way. Few do it better than Dr. Bernardo Castro. He's really become one of the world's most well-known idealist philosophers, uh, in a nutshell, meaning that he holds consciousness to be the fundamental substance of reality. He believes a kind of universal mind underpins reality. Bernardo holds two PhDs, one in computer science and one in philosophy. He's also the executive director of the Essencia Foundation, which aims to communicate metaphysical idealism uh, like Bernardo's to a larger audience. Bernardo is also the author of 10 books, including Jung's Metaphysics, which features quite heavily in present mind meld. Speaking of, Jungian fare does feature prominently in this episode. We riff on synchronicity, the collective unconscious, archetypes, and why all of that really culminates rather nicely into a very similar philosophy to Bernardo's, into a idealist philosophy. We also do a pretty deep dive into the topic of the UAP uh, UFO phenomenon, why it's so intriguing and seductive, yet perplexing and even maddening, as it has, uh, as Bernardo will point out, compromised the minds of even really brilliant uh, level-headed investigators. I promise you we're going to get into some angles of that topic you have not considered. And of course, consciousness is also a talking point that runs throughout this mind meld as well, along with so much more. All of the links that you will need for Bernardo Castrip are in the description. Same for third eye drops. On that note, as far as I know, the YouTube algorithm is not conscious, but it must feed. It must be fed in the form of likes, subs, comments, shares, whatever. So please do so. It means a great deal. Also, did you know we've got over 300 audio-only podcasts that will never be posted here to YouTube with hundreds of brilliant beings, including one with Bernardo Castro from a couple of years back. Uh, you can only hear that on podcast platforms, so do subscribe on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen. And if you would like to initiate yourself a layer deeper, join an exclusive community, get rewards, gain access to a patron-only Discord and Zoom hangs, a book club, and more. Join us over at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. It is also the best, most direct way to support these transmissions. And with that, my friends, 
Let's Meld Minds with the brilliant Dr. Bernardo Castrop. Welcome back to the Mind Meld Bernardo. You are always one of the most requested guests. People love to ask me, have you ever heard of Bernardo Castrop? And I'm always like, yes, I've I've talked to the man for for many hours on recording, but it seems I must do it more. And I'm don't get me wrong, I'm happy to. I'm excited to talk to you again. again my I'm friend. very happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, I just finished your Jung book, which is tremendous. It's a great um condensing of a lot of his core ideas. And I was going to say Trojan horse, but I don't know if it's even a Trojan horse. I just think you do a great job of also demonstrating that Jung directly fits in the lineage of idealists. I mean, some people may debate that, but I think you do a pretty irrefutable job of arguing that point in that book. Um, it's very clear throughout his corpus that the underlying metaphysics uh, that he has playing the back of his mind is idealism. Speaking of Jung, one of the most popular topics, like I, uh, like just like I can't talk to you enough, something I seem to not be able to talk about enough is synchronicity. Like people just love exploring the ins and outs, the potential like metaphysics involved. Um, and I've come across a surprising like I thought I had kind of exhausted the broad strokes of synchronicity at least with the first video I did on the topic. Um, and then I became aware of some new ideas and I explored those in another video. And both of those videos have been really popular. And you dedicate a whole chapter to synchronicity in your book on Jung. And, and I love that because you demonstrate that it's, it's not just a fun idea. It's actually potentially core to his metaphysics. And, and in some strange way, maybe even core to the existence of reality in some way, but we, we can get there. We can get there. That might sound far flung to open with, but um, why do you think synchronicity is such an important thing to explore thoroughly when you're talking about Jung? Well, next to the potential applications to life, like if you pay attention to the, to the world around you, you may get insights into your own psychic state, into your own mind, which is, you know, maybe far out for our culture today now, but if it turns out to be true, it has obvious applications to how we live our lives. Um, but um, my greatest, the, the greatest reason for my interest in synchronicity was that uh, next to all the rest of the case for Jung being an idealist, synchronicity uh, uh, definitively clenches, <laughs> clenches the deal mm -hmm. um, because the idea behind synchronicity is that there is a correspondence of uh, archetypal behavior between what's happening in our minds and what is happening in the world around us. They both unfold according to the same templates, and these templates are archetypal. And Jung is not ambiguous at all when he says that archetypal are the, the, the sine qua non of mind space, mm. the defining feature mm. of the mind space. The archetypes are psychic. Um, so the moment you say that the templates of behavior of our psyche, our mind, correspond to the templates beha template behaviors of the world around us in order to generate these meaningful coincidences, the moment you say that, you are saying that the world around us too is psychic, it's mental, and it unfolds according to the same mental archetypes as our own mind, why? Because our own mind is part of the world. Yeah. We are not separate from the world. So the implication is that there is only one psychic field spanning the entire world and everybody and everybody's minds. It's all psychic. It's all uh, mental. And it appears to us as physical in a way equivalent to how dreams appear to us as physical, even though dreams too are obviously psychic. They are manifestations of the personal or the collective unconscious. So the world too is a manifestation of the collective unconscious, the transpersonal layer, the atavistic, primitive or, or original layer of mind before we started evolving higher level mental functions. The world around us too is mental. It's, it is the collective unconscious presenting itself to us in physical form, just as 
our dreams seem to have a physical form, with the exception that now this physical form is shared. And you see the same physical world that I, that, that I see. And that shouldn't be a surprise because these are manifestations of the collective unconscious uh, within which you and I are immersed as well. And, and, and also, remember, Jung developed the theory of synchronicity together with uh, Wolfgang Pauli, yeah. who was a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist um, already at the time. He was discussing this with Jung in the 1950s. There is a, a, a wealth of correspondence between mm -hmm. the two written correspondence in which they discuss these ideas. So Pauli, a physicist, didn't immediately back off saying, no, this stuff is nonsense. The, the yeah. physical world cannot be psychic or mental at, at its you know, foundation, at, at, at its ontological foundations. He didn't do that. He kept on engaging with Jung for years. So he was taking this idea seriously as well. Yeah, and some people don't know that he was actually a patient of Jung's before this correspondence. So they had a history of doing, you know, long-term dream work together. So clearly, Pauli took this realm of psyche very seriously, and they took great pains to be... To, it's really interesting and challenging reading their correspondence, because like I was saying to you before, like pointing people in the direction of where to start with Jung is challenging to begin with. And man, if you you need a lot of education to approach those correspondence between Jung and Pauli. Like they'll go from talking about like the Timaeus to speculative quantum physics to, you know, other more technical ideas of Jung's. And it's like, man, you really got to have all this vocabulary at your disposal to, to pick up what they're putting down. But it does show that they were doing their best to, to do this effort that I think people like you are carrying the torch on, which is trying to take these seemingly disparate areas of inquiry into the nature of reality, into the nature of mind and, you know, uh, the bigger metaphysical questions that everybody has and, and trying to find where they overlap and how they practically complement and inform one another. And, and that's what always turns me on so much about Jung is he's, he's not one of these people who's trying to reduce the mystery, he's trying to expand the mystery, you know, like, I mean, even, you know, he, he's very fond of using words like mysterium and using words like, uh, uh, you know, the, these Latin terms like unus mundus that, that sort of like bring everything together, but in a plausible way that feels good and, and, and enlivening to the soul. And synchronicity is one of those central things because it places you in the cockpit like your your consciousness is is required for the synchronicity to make sense. It's like, you know, it's a meaningful coincidence to you personally. And that personal element of it is, I think, probably what gets people so uh, jazzed up about the topic is, is it something that they've experienced that seems not to fit in to materialist, reductionist reality. And in some ways, that's a slippery slope for sure, but it's also, to me, one of the most compelling things I've experienced that, I mean, just from, from a pure statistics standpoint, you know, like w when you have a really complex synchronicity, like a couple that you talk about in the book or the, uh, you know, the famous scarab example that Jung talks about, um, or some that I've talked about on the show, it's just, you know, if, if you want to use statistics as a argument for things being likely. I mean, man, I, I don't even know if you can calculate the, the statistics necessary for, for some of the things you talk about in the book. The problem of statistics in science, statistics, statistics um, are a basic tool in science. Discoveries are always based on statistics. You know, uh, uh, is your discovery at three sigma level, you know, a certain chance, mm -hmm. a, a certain likelihood against pure chance the likelihood that you have a real effect as opposed to just a chance effect and you have to be at least at three sigma or a million to one in order to be able to declare a discovery but despite the fact that statistics are so central to the scientific method um, 
statistics are always incredibly ambiguous. Yeah. They create a situation in which you can interpret things always according to your favorite paradigm. In other words, you can rely on statistics to defend whatever bias or prejudice you have. And the reason is, suppose you, you know, we found the Higgs boson 11 yeah. years ago. And uh, that was around three sigma at the time. It's probably much higher now. The three sigma was enough. Million to one chance was could enough you, for us to say. Could you explain what three sigma means? When you have a statistical distribution, it usually has a shape like this, a, norm, a normal curve. Uh -huh. So m most of what you see is around a, a, main, a middle oh, value yeah, yeah. or an average value or a mean value. And then you have the, the other things happening around for which there is less chance of that uh, occurring. It. So three sigma is how unlikely your measurement is compared to the average measurement, how far you are from, from the mean value of that yeah, curve. Right. If you're far enough, you can say, well, okay, this is not just chance because chance uh, uh, is unlikely to be far away from the average uh, that you get. If you are consistently not only getting that bump in the middle, but you have an, another bump here, then you have a different effect there. It's not just the randomness of the statistical di distribution uh, around another mean value. In other words, it's a figure that tells you how likely or unlikely your result is uh, to be just a chance effect as opposed to a real effect. You're seeing something real, uh, you know, a real causation there that reflects a phenomenon um, that, that you've, you hope to have discovered. The problem is that uh, in, in science, whatever you see, you can always say, well, it's unlikely that this is by chance, but it can still have been just by chance, so we can ignore the result. You can always ignore what doesn't fit with your paradigm because random data can have any pattern. And that's a fundamental contradiction at the heart of our uh, scientific epistemology. We define randomness as data whose distribution has no discernible pattern. Yeah. The first, first problem is that the word discernible already appeals to our intellectual capacities. Mm -hmm. It's not, there's no discernible pattern if we can't find a pattern, which doesn't mean that there isn't a pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So it begins there. Um, but ignore this for the moment. We define randomness as a distribution of measurements or data in which we can find no uh, discernible pattern. But then we also say that in random data, however unlikely, it is possible for there to be any pattern. Yeah. So you see the contradiction. Randomness is supposed to have no pattern, but it can have any pattern. So if you have a scientific experiment and you find a result that contradicts, say, the metaphysics of materialism, you can always say, well, randomness can have any pattern, so we can ignore this, because we know that it a priori is not possible to be a real effect. You see, that's the problem. So, yeah. And that's exactly what we do with synchronicities. It doesn't matter how you calculate your numbers. Somebody who is skeptical of the world around us having mental roots or, or, of, of being mental or psychic at its foundations can always say it's just a coincidence. doesn't matter how unlikely it is to be a coincidence. Uh, uh, randomness allows for any pattern to be present without it meaning anything. So when, it, when, it's con when something contradicts the paradigm, we say, well, randomness can have any pattern. When it fits the paradigm and we find the Higgs boson with a million to one against chance, uh, uh, we say, oh, no, this is too unlikely to be random. It's the real Higgs boson. And I, it's arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You see, um, there is uh, a project that was run out of, um, I forgot the university, uh, um, in Pennsylvania. There is a uh, Princeton, out of Princeton. In yeah, a, this project was run, run out of Princeton. Princeton for many years, uh, it was called the Global Consciousness Project, mm -hmm. and it had to do with the correlation of uh, uh, the results of random number generators. You know, the, yeah. the string produced, string of numbers uh, produced by random number generators placed around the world, and and major news, major human events like 9/11, mm -hmm. breakout mm -hmm. of a war, 
um, the death of somebody very famous, uh, events that produce an emotional outpouring. And scientists wanted to know, is there a correlation between this quantum random number generators, their behavior, and the emotional outpouring happening in the world? And they found an exquisite correlation. In a, uh, it was billions against chance that yeah. such a correlation could happen. But of course, we just dismissed it because random data can have any pattern. So we are seeing just ghosts. But when you measure something in a, a particle accelerator that was predicted by normal science, we say, oh, no, 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 this is too unlikely to be a chance effect. There is, there is something real in here. <laughs> So yeah, that's yeah. the problem. You see, it's, statistics are very useful, but they are also the Achilles heel of how we go about the business of science and philosophy. Right, right. And I mean, you with something like synchronicity too, it's almost like the mean is infinity. You know, it's like because there is no, we don't understand what the enclosing contextual container even is for a synchronicity. Because to understand it, you would have to understand more about the psyche than we can m at least measure. And, and in a lot of ways, you know, I think you, you say something very similar in the book is like, you know, it's, I mean, to, to throw to throw what you say in the book onto a synchronicity, what's the weight of a synchronicity? What's the what's the width? You know, like what, what are the what are the measurable elements of it other than the phenomenological ones or the subjective ones that you're having while it's occurring like it's something that i don't even think you can calculate you know like especially when you have all of these um where it's not just two things lining up maybe it's three things maybe it's four things and it's just i don't i don't know if you could even apply it to it um i know people love a good synchronicity story would do you want to share one from the book like um which, whichever one you you feel like uh the <laughs> I mentioned some stories that Jung himself told, but probably people are familiar with it, like the one you mentioned, the Scarab. Yeah. I had uh, two personal synchronicities when I was researching and writing the book. There was one time, this was in 2019, I think. Um, I was at... Um, the Bowdens, a uh, Lake Constance, that's the English word, uh, in Germany, be between Germany and Switzerland. Switzerland on one side, Germany on the other. And Jung was born in Kessvill, which is a Swiss village uh, at the margins of Lake Constance. And I was there, not because I was researching any archive, but part of my research is to sort of absorb the world of the person I'm writing about. Yeah. So not only you know, scholarly research, you know, Jungian archives are not there. He lived there for six months as a baby before he fam his family moved. Mm. But I wanted, I wanted to get a feeling. Uh, I wanted to breathe the air of the place where he was born. And, uh, and I was there with my feet, bare feet inside the lake, looking at the place where I knew Jung was born and enjoying a you know, sunny afternoon, summer, sunny afternoon, early summer, with my feet in Lake Constance, walking on the little pebbles, uh, just underwater, like, uh, I don't know, 10 inches underwater. And, um, and at some point, while looking at the place where I knew Jung was born, I remember the story he tells in his um, heavily edited uh, autobiography yeah. of a time when he, as an adult, was dealing with his own psychic challenges, his own psychic problems. And to help himself, he started playing as a kid with the pebbles from, from the lake. It was another lake. It was uh, Lake uh, Thuy, uh, where he was uh, uh, living. Uh, but he recounts building a little town out of pebbles from the lake, and he built a little church, and he was missing a pebble to play the role of altar inside the church. Yeah. And then he looks down, and he sees a red, four-sided, pyramidal, pebble in the lake and he says oh that 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 was ideal for the altar so he picked it and put put inside the altar i remember when i read that for the first time i was like i don't know 15 16 years old i remember thinking a four-sided symmetric pyramidal lake yeah. pebble red 
this stuff doesn't exist. What kind of erosion would do that? Erosion usually rounds all sides off equally. So you get a smooth round pebble, you know, maybe a bit, a bit elongated and maybe a little bit elliptical, but not a four-sided pyramid. Yeah, for sure. Right? And I attributed that to Jung's poetic license. He saw a four-sided uh, pyramidal pebble, but it wasn't. And I remember this as I had my feet stepping on pebbles in Lake Constance, uh, on the margins of which Jung was born. And I, in, when I had the thought, I in, instantly looked down. And right in front of me, there was a four-sided red pyramidal yeah. lake pebble. Uh, of course, I, I have it with me at home. It's downstairs. And uh, I have, there is a photo of it in a book mm -hmm. taken just after I found it. When, once I was at home, I measured it. And it was exactly the same size wow. that Jung reports in the book, one and a half inches or two inches, one and a half inches. Um, and of course, when I found it, my first, because I, I have this very analytic disposition. So my first thought was synchronicity. But my second thought was, oh, wait a moment, wait a moment, hold your horses. Maybe there are lots of pyramidal stones here, in which case finding one means nothing. So I started looking for another one for half an hour. There was nothing anywhere near. Mm -hmm. there, there wasn't even a red stone, let alone a four-sided uh, pyramidal stone. So yeah. I thought, no, that, that, that's not the case. And then my next thought was, what if I had seen the stone first um, subliminally without being aware of it? And that subliminal perception then led to the thought of Jung's story, in which case it's not a synchronicity, it's just causality. I first saw the stone, which caused me to think about that story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then I played the tape back and I realized I was not looking down at all. I was lost in a long stream of thought about Jung and Jung's birthplace as I was walking slowly, looking ahead to the place where he was born. And, 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 and that, that reverie started, like, I don't know, 50 meters earlier, far away from where the stone was. So I reassured myself I hadn't uh, looked down synchronicity. But that's not the end. <laughs> oh. Two days later, this is in the book too. Two days later, okay. I was uh, hiking, hiking in the Swiss Alps with, oh, yeah. with my partner, my girlfriend. And um, we found ourselves completely alone in a fairly remote valley in the Swiss Alps. Um, Val Fedos, uh, uh, Fedos Valley. Um, it's close to, to Sils and Engadin, Sils Maria. Uh, it's close to that, but it, it, it's, it's behind the mountain range next to Sils. Mm. So it's, it's a few hours hike, and we were there completely alone. It was early summer, so there was a strong stream um, almost a raging river of melted snow flowing down. And right in the middle of that stream, there was a four-sided symmetric pyramidal boulder, which I photographed and the photos in the book two days later. And I looked at that and my first thought was somebody sculpted it. It's some kind yeah. of modern art. Somebody sculpted it and put it here. So fantastically pyramidal <laughs> it was. Uh, but no. No, it was really, it, it was not placed there. The rest of the boulder continued under the water level. Um, so it was eroded. Yeah, so there is such a thing as symmetrical four-sided pyramidal erosion, apparently. But those are the only two instances I have ever seen in my life. And it was like the second time. Yeah. Another pyramid. So I, I figured this is like a, a series of synchronicities telling me, never dismiss what Jung writes. Right. As I had dismissed the four-sided pyramidal pebble, I thought, oh, it's his active imagination, his poetic license. It's what he saw. It was not really what was there. And it's like the universe was cons conspiring to tell me, as I was writing a book about Jung, don't dismiss the guy. Yeah. Take him seriously, even when he saw it sounds implausible. Don't dismiss it. Here you go. Two pyramidal uh, 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 rocks, one a pebble, the other one a boulder, one and a half meter high, you know, coming up uh, up to my chest level. And and both embody exactly what you thought was implausible in Jung's words. Yeah. And that made me very humble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so what do you think the odds are, Bernardo, that you have his pyramid? 
that 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 I mean the odds have to be tiny, but I'm sure that the thought has crossed your mind that this ha- what no. if this is Jung's really? No, no, zero, zero, oh, because wow. uh, Jung's pebble was in another lake, oh, was in Lake okay. uh, Zurich, where he was living at the time. Okay, so he was born on the margins of a lake, then then he moved. To, to a place near uh, the Rhine Falls, the, the little waterfall of the, the, the Rhine uh, River. Uh, and then he moved to, to, to Zurich, um, Zurich. He moved to Zurich, Lake Zurich. And uh, <clears throat> there he found his pebble. So it's not the same. Man. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah. But, but it doesn't okay. need to be the same. That's not what synchronicities are about. Right. It doesn't need to be the same. It's the archetypal tone that needs to correspond. Yes. And that correspondence of tone, of meaning, of, of semantics, uh, that was uh, squarely there. Two wise, including the second time, a very big one. It's like, you know, it's like the universe eliminating every shadow of a doubt yeah. that there is meaning in what it's showing you. Now, I'm not yeah. saying that the boulder in Val Fedos was magically placed there and floated across the air, was sculpted by an angel. That's not what I'm saying. The boulder was already there. The pebble was already there. They were both natural constructs of erosion. The synchronicity is my stepping on that one pebble amongst the right. billions of pebbles I could have stepped on. Exactly when I was thinking about Jung's pebble. That's the synchronicity. The yes. synchronicity is that two days after this, of all the times I could have been in Val Fedos, because I used to live in Switzerland, uh, I was on that one valley, very remote one, not another living human being uh, around me and my girlfriend, only some marmots. The, our only company for that entire day were marmots. And when we came back, it was getting dark already, that I was there, of all valleys where I could be in the in the Ober Engadin, or in the Engadin, because we were in the entire Engadin, of all valleys I could be, of any year I could be in any one of those valleys that I was yeah. on that one in the place where that pyramidal boulder was two days after the first synchronicity. That's the synchronicity. It's not an appeal to magic. It has to do with the correspondence of my psychic state and the state of the world. That correspondence may or may not happen without the world having to become magical uh, for this to happen. Yeah, I've I've told this story, Bernardo. But can I run one by you? Can I run my most my most uh, psyche quaking uh, synchronicity? So this was a few years ago. I'm going to try to speed run it because I have told this story before. But it was 2019. Me and a good friend of mine, Colin Frangicetto, decided we were going to go to Peru and do ayahuasca for the first time. So this was already a very emotionally, psychically charged thing. We were both approaching with a lot of respect. We did our dieta. You know, we were, you know, in the mindset. Um, I was leaving from Chicago in the States. He was leaving from Portland. So he was already on his first leg of the flight. I was boarding my flight in Chicago. And as my flight is boarding, they cancel the flight. And I'm immediately in this state of just disarray, not, oh, oh God, okay, what do I do now? I'm trying to get in touch with him because we were supposed to meet in Lima, get on the same plane in Lima, fly to Iquitos, which has very limited flights in. So it was just a very stressful moment. So I'm told I can't fly out until the following morning and I'm forced to just pick a hotel to stay at. Meanwhile, I'm I'm texting my friend. I'm saying, hey, man, I guess I'm still going to get there in time, but I'm not going to be able to meet you in Lima and whatever. So I'm en route to this hotel. Um, and uh, I, I, I guess I'm at the hotel. So he starts telling me, man, I just started doing this thing that my wife told me about, that her therapist recommended that she tries this visualization. Um, and the weirdest thing just happened to me. And I'm like, okay. So he goes, so the visualization is you close your eyes and you just kind of imagine roses growing all around you and roses are protecting you. And, um, he's like, I'm doing this visualization in, in the airport because, you know, we're both kind of just stressed out. And then he opens his eyes and He's like, you're not going to believe this, but there's a guy in front of me 
with a rose tattoo up his arm, on his neck, on his head, and on his luggage. And he starts sending me pictures of this guy. And I, I have the pictures and I posted them in another video. And as he's telling me this, everything in my body just starts like, like all the hairs stand on end because Bernardo, the random hotel that I chose to stay at was called the Rose Hotel. <laughs> so, and I'm looking down at a menu that has Rose embossed in the menu, like at that exact moment that he's sending me these texts. So it's like, not only... It, it, you know, not only just the, the strangeness of, of his experience, the novelty of the timing with going and doing something like ayahuasca, but also on my end, the, the selection of the Rose Hotel. And very similarly to yours with the pyramid being this already very archetypally charged symbol, the Rose has this long history in, in, in esoteric circles. like The Rosicrucians. Yeah, yeah, the Rosicrucians and... Believe me, I've gone down the rabbit hole of trying to discern every possible piece of symbolism having to do with the rose. But yeah, it just it goes to show that there are these things that can happen. And I, I don't I don't know, like, you know, it's, it's it's almost just like everything feels like it's short circuiting when they happen. But yet it's also and, more real somehow. Yeah, look, it's it's well known that uh, psychedelic trips constellate synchronicities yeah. before and after. Um, and when I say that, I, I, I don't mean that the psychedelic trip has a retrocausal effect. You know, an influence goes from the future back to the past. Yeah. No, because synchronicity is precisely not about causality. So the claim is not that the thought of Jung caused the pyramidal pebble to materialize. The claim is not that the future psychedelic trip caused you to have a synchronicity around the theme of roses. That's not the claim. Synchronicity is defined as being orthogonal to causality. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not caused. We are not talking about cause and effect here. Synchronicity is about the correspondence of archetypal state. Yeah. Um, and that can be constellated merely by a certain state of mind and there is no doubt that when you are about to have a psychedelic trip your state of mind changes especially if it's your first trip then your state of mind changes days in advance like because you start feeling the thing coming yeah. you know that it's going to be a defining experience that will violate all of your references that will take you completely out of your comfort zone it may even destroy and temporarily destroy your ego oh yeah so that psychic state that anticipation uh, is a very archetypal psychic state. State, It's um, similar to the anticipation of death, and death is very archetypal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's no surprise that when you constellate that kind of inner psychic state associated with the coming psychedelic trip, um, that you will experience synchronicities that that constellation will instantiate something in the world around you, not as a causation, but as a correspondence of meaning, a correspondence uh, of form. Um, it's, the, the way to visualize it is not to think that your psychic state caused the, the world state or that the world state caused your psychic state. That's just causality. The way to think of it, if you need to think in causal terms, which is wrong, but if you need right. to, because you cannot think in terms of correspondences, you have to think in terms of causality, then what you have to do is to think of a third thing that causes both the state of the world and your inner psychic state to correspond. Yeah. So, you, so there is no magic here because that third thing is nature. Mm -hmm, and nature mm -hmm. is everywhere. Are, are you familiar with... Um, so this is, this is you're, you're perfectly teeing this up for me, Bernardo, because in that second exploration of synchronicity that I did, um, I map the notion of uh, Penrose's three, three world model over the phenomenon of synchronicity. And for people who aren't familiar with this, just imagine an equilateral triangle. Um, you know, on the left, you have uh, your personal mental state. On the right, you have the physical outer reality. And the third, in Penrose's own, own words, is the platonic realm of forms. So if you seemingly, you know, we there should not be an ability, at least everyday experience and conventional 
science tells us there should not be an ability for for mental and physical causation. Like there there it there shouldn't be a there there, in quotes. But if you do have this third thing, which I may be projecting your word nature onto this, but if you have this third thing that sort of is the, I guess let's keep it platonic and say like the the emanating source of intelligibility in and of itself, of symbol in and of itself. And of course, let's remember that Jung compared archetypes to the platonic idos, to the platonic images. That kind of squares that circle. Is like you you are there's co-participation in this in this triune uh sort of reality that is where the boundaries are only illusory or or apparent or subjective. Like there really is not a barrier. It just seems like there's a barrier. And what proves to you that there is no barrier is when all three of those things harmonize at once in a way that violates your normal sense of of normalcy. Um, does does that harmonize with your thoughts or or do you take yes. any issue with that yes but with a very important qualification and yeah. disclaimer so roger sometimes is accused of being a trialist hmm. so not a monist not a dualist but a trialist yeah he's accused of postulating three to some extent incommensurable or at least essentially distinct uh, realms and um insofar as you interpret his position that way I think it's wrong because it's highly inflationary. We, we don't need three qu completely different kinds of things to make sense of, of nature. We need only one, mind, which is nature's given. We just have to understand that mind extends beyond our personal minds. Your thoughts are mental, but they are outside my mind. So is in the inanimate world, which we call the physical world around us, also mental perceived as colloquially physical just as i perceive your inner conscious life as colloquially physical if you cry i know that you're sad if you smile i know that you're happy your inner emotions or inner mental life presents itself presents itself to me in a colloquially physical sense and so the rest of nature presents itself to us in a colloquially physical sense mm -hmm. but nature too may be constituted of mental states just like my inner life is constituted of mental states. And as my inner life, which is mental, presents itself to you now as colloquially physical, so does nature present itself to me as colloquially physical. So in that sense, um, I am a, a downright monist. Yeah. I don't postulate two different realms, let alone three. Having said that, if... If you start from a monist base, in my case, mental monism or idealism, um, it's valid to think of the expressions of that mind, the one mind of nature, and, and, and establish a taxonomy of different kinds of expression of mm. that mind of nature. Yeah. That, that is valid. And from that perspective, you could say, my perceptions are one category. My perceptions are mental. They are created by my mind. Um, but they look and feel differently than my thoughts and emotions, which are also mental and are also created by my mind. Um, I can describe my perception through numbers like inches, kilograms, and so on. If I lift a piece of luggage, I can describe that mental, perceptual, qualitative feeling of lifting the luggage, I can describe it with 50 kilos, for instance, weight. Or I can describe the redness of, of, of a strawberry as, what is it, 470 terahertz, whatever it is. No, okay. yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, but I can't describe my thoughts in centimeters or inches or kilograms or pounds or, or hertz and coulombs, joules. Uh, I can't do that. So even though my thoughts and emotions are mental and my perception is mental, they are of different types. They are both expressions of the one mind of nature. So I'm not talking about a, a, a substance dualism here, 
but I'm, I'm talking about a qualitative categorization or, or yeah, uh, uh, um, a taxonomy of different types of experience that we can do. And we can also talk about the inherent properties of the mind of nature. Because to be, to exist, is to have properties. Everything that exists can be described in some way. Yeah. It, it, has a, it is what it is and not something else. In other words, it has certain properties and not others. So the mind of nature too, because it exists, has inherent properties. It is what it is and not something else. We call those properties archetypes. Yeah. In other words, the mind of nature preferentially behaves in certain ways and not others. Just like a guitar string, when you pluck it, it preferentially, preferentially vibrates in a certain frequency and not others. That's why your guitar has six different kinds of strings. Uh, they have they are made of different materials and they are constructed in different ways. So each one of the six will preferentially oscillate in a different uh, uh, frequency so you can produce more notes. So is the mind of nature. It preferentially vibrates or preferentially resonates in certain ways according to certain harmonics and not others. That preferential template of excitation, the template of behavior is what we call an archetype. And the mind of nature has certain archetypes and not other conceivable archetypes. So now we can speak of three things. We can speak of the archetypes, we can speak of the qualities of perception, and we can speak of the qualities of endogenous experiences. Three things, but all three are one. Yeah. It's the mind of nature. So if you interpret uh, Sir Roger's uh, you know, trialistic idea, not as substance trialism but as expression trialism then yes i am on board with that yeah long disclaimer to give you a simple yeah. answer you've got to take the platonism all the way and and go to the initial first cause that that draws the circle around the three or yeah i mean i i guess there there really is no way to to visualize it correctly because pretty much everything platon is right about the one is sort of a negative statement that it's not this, it's not that, it's not this. Um, but I do think it's really interesting. And to steal a a word from John Vervacki that I've been using ever since I talked to him recently, is it's like, it's this transjective relationship, as he calls it. Like, it's not, it, it's, a, it's a codependent existence where one thing implies the other in a sort of relationship that just has to exist that way you can't take any one piece out of it and say that no this is like the only thing it's like no it's it's that way because it has to be that way like there has to be the subject and object are one it, it's it's and in, in this case the the overarching oneness is consciousness and this admittedly is not what vervaki thinks like vervaki has this um also platonic argument of sorts he, he calls he calls it neoplatonic at least is that the the emanation and the the bottom up response to the emanation are are one thing like they're just as real as one another and i i personally have problems squaring that how how emanator or or the or consciousness um or the one whatever you want to call it wouldn't be an a priori necessity of the bottom up thing, but maybe I'm getting lost in the weeds here. <clears throat> no, no. I, th look, it's not only John Verveke. It um, um, Carlo Rovelli uh, runs into the same issue. This idea of codependent emergence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That um, two things that didn't exist can come into existence, but then only in a codependent way, like one gives the foundation of existence for the other. It, it's poetic. There is some truth to it, uh, but it leads to infinite regress. So there has to, we have to dig deeper. Let, let me take Rovelli's case, so, because I am more familiar with it. Uh, Carlo, he, I think he correctly interprets quantum mechanics as relational. If you look at quantum theory, it allows for two different descriptions of the same series of events and it's like well what a moment if they are different then either both are wrong 
or at least one is wrong, you, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you can you cannot have two different descriptions of the same series of events and have both be right. Well, right, like saying it's one can, and zero at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can have that if the events are relational. In other words, if they don't exist in absolute terms, but only in relative terms. So the event as observed by me is one thing, and the same event as observed by you is another thing. Of course, logic requires us to imagine that there is an absolute event that is being looked at from one perspective by you and looked at from another perspective by me. So we see two different aspects aspects of the same underlying absolute event but quantum mechanics denies that there can be such a physical absolute hmm. all physical entities are relational in other words there is no absolute to ground the relational the relation so an event only exists as a relation between what happens and the thing that is observing what happens and they are codependent they co-arise same story uh, um, that you described with Verveke, but mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. rigorous and theoretical in, uh, uh, along the lines of physics. So this is equivalent to saying that um, everything in nature is movement because, because movement is relational. There is no absolute mm. movement. This is, if you're yeah. sitting inside a train, the train's not moving. But if you're on a platform and the train passes along, passes by, then the train is move, moving. Now, which one is right? No, both or none, because movement is relational. Movement is not an absolute thing. If there were only one elementary subatomic particle in the universe, we couldn't speak of movement. If there is nothing else to provide a reference, is that one particle moving or not moving? It doesn't matter. Movement loses its meaning if there is only one thing and no yeah. reference. Yeah, yeah. Right? So movement is sort of the classic example of a relational property that's not grounded um, in one absolute thing. So what Ravelli is saying is that uh, all nature is like movement, but there is nothing that moves. And that mm. is incoherent. <laughs> and to, to deal with this incoherence, uh, Carlo goes to Nagarjuna, you know, the third, sixth century or third century uh, Buddhist uh, mystic, and, and he suddenly breaks away from explicit logical mathematical <clears throat> articulation and he starts getting vague <clears throat> and appealing to some intuitions and stuff because it's the only way he can he can square yeah, his yeah. circle <laughs> you, i was literally thinking that exact phrase bernardo that was yeah you, pl you but, uh, pulled it right out it 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 you cannot do it because if you're saying everything is movement you are implying that there exist at least two absolute things in order for your your allusion to movement to have meaning. Yeah. Movement has no meaning if there is nothing that moves. Isn't that obvious? Uh, a, a relation has no meaning un unless there are at least two absolute things that relate. Um, so this, this talk of co-rise is ultimately incoherent. It's a form of hand-waving. It's a form of saying, well, well, we don't really know the answer, but uh, blah, 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 well, there is no answer. You <laughs> know what I mean? Um, I think what we have, the bullet we have to bite when it comes to Rovelli's relational quantum mechanics, which I think is correct, is the following. Yes, all physical entities, in other words, all entities describable by physical quantities, yeah. such as inches, uh, degrees per second, uh, uh, electrical charge, joules, whatever, all physical entities are relational. But the things that relate in order for there to be meaning to relationships and physical entities, those things exist. They are, they are absolute, but they are not physical. Right, right. That's the step you have to take. The recognition that all physical entities are relational does not imply that there is only movement and nothing that moves. It implies that there are absolutes that are not physical and yes. which ground the existence of physical entities. That's the obvious implication. But of course, Carlo is a physicist. 
he will deny the existence of anything that isn't physical, mm. anything that isn't describable through physical quantities. And then he has to engage in the hand wave, you know, Nagarjuna and the mysticism and all this stuff. Um, and maybe John, I'm not as familiar with his work, but maybe he's trying to perform a similar miracle speaking of relations without things that relate and all this co-rise and all that stuff, what everything is indicating is that the real world that we are actually measuring isn't physical, in, not in the sense of being spiritual or some vague gas use, woo -woo, no, in the sense of not being describable through physical quantities. Just like your thought is not describable with inches and kilograms and pounds, just like your emotions are not describable with terahertz, or, or, or jewels. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? yeah. The and, real states of the world are not describable through physical quantities. Physical states are what we get when we measure the real states of the world. And then physical states are obviously relational because a measurement is a relationship between the thing that measures and the thing that is measured. Yeah. And that's why everything that is physical is relational. Everything that is physical is like movement. That doesn't imply that there is nothing that moves. On the contrary, it precisely implies that there is that which moves. It's just not physical. Yeah. And and what's crazy is that Platonists seem to be laying out this metaphysics 2,500 years ago. Because if you look at their, you know, their sort of metaphysical schema, you don't actually get into the realm of anima and so, like soul until you're several degrees away from whatever from the one like you have the one and the forms and like the noetic and all, the things that only move exist in in this realm so and i'm using that in you know quotes so they're they're kind of laying out something almost indistinguishably similar from what you're talking about in that no there 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 is this this realm of i guess i prefer archetypes but it's it's the same idea that there that there are are these things that transcend the physical and the movement and the coming physically in and out of being that exist in still in some kind of ontologically real way but they're just not physical they can't be measured so it's like you're it's like you're trying to explain the outside of Plato's cave from the inside of Plato's <laughs> cave in some way to stick with other platonic uh metaphors There's there is there is a more modern metaphor that I think we we all can understand. It's the, the airplane cockpit. I don't know whether you know. We heard. I, I think we've talked talk about this. Yeah, yeah. But but tell it again, please. <laughs> so the metaphor is that uh, you know think of an airplane. It has sensors that measure airspeed, mm -hmm. air humidity, and all kinds of you know, the states of the sky outside of the airplane. Those measurements are then presented to the pilots in the form of dashboard indications the dials on the pilot's dashboard move left and right they they move and and, and tell you um what the result of that measurement of a state of the sky uh, was in other words the dials represent the states of the sky they accurately yeah. convey information about the sky as a representation but it would be absurd to say that the dashboard is the sky no, it represents the sky. It doesn't even look like the sky. The sky with clouds and lightning and the horizon doesn't look like round dials on an airplane's dashboard. Yet the dashboard conveys accurate information about the sky, so much so that if the pilot, pilot ignores it, it will crash and burn. You have to take the dashboard seriously, but without confusing it with the sky itself. Now, we are the same like the airplane. We have sensors, our retinas, eardrums, yeah. outer surface of the skin, tongue, inner lining of the nose. Those, those sensors make measurements about the states of the world ar around us, the real states of the world. And those measurements are then represented or presented to us in the form of what we call perception, the things we see, hear, touch, taste, smell. Perception is thus akin to a dashboard. Yeah. It represents the states of the world accurately without being the states of the world. The problem is that we think our dashboard is the world. We think that the things we see, touch, taste, smell uh, uh, um, are the things that are really out there. We are like pilots who were born inside an airplane cockpit without windows. Yeah. We can't see the world as it is. All we have is the dashboard. And because that's all we have ever had, we think the dashboard is the world. 
And everything works as though the dashboard were the world, because it does convey accurate information about the world that helps us not crash and burn. It helps us not step in front of a train. It doesn't mean that there is a real train out there. It's just, just like an airplane dashboard giving you all kinds of indications about a storm outside. If you don't pay attention to it, the storm is going to kill you. It's going to crash your plane. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the indications on the dashboard are the storm. It doesn't mean that the train is the thing that is out there. And that's how we all get confused. We take our dashboards for the real world. <clears throat> and of course, our dashboards are consistent with one another because they are all representing measurements of the same real world in which we really are. But that world is not the dashboard. So when you say the realm of the archetypes, that's just the real world. Right, right, right. We are not talking about some elusive, spiritual, cloudy, you know, vague something in some other dimension. No, no, none of this stuff. We are talking about what is really right around us right now. It's the yes. real stuff. It's <clears throat> reality. You now, very present, very real, doesn't depend on our presence in order to exist, doesn't care what we think of it. It's entirely objective from our point of view, even though it's probably subjective from its own point of view, just like my thoughts are objective from your point of view. You can't change my thoughts just by wishing them to be different. And my thoughts would still be here, even if you are not there. Same thing for the real states of the world, even if they are mental, they're objective from our point of view. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and the archetypes are the, the resonant frequencies of vibration, so to say, of these real states of the world. They are the preferential templates of behavior of these real states of the world. In other words, the realm of the archetypes is right in front yes, of you yes. right now. It's what there is. It's what exists. And we represent it in our internal dashboard as what we colloquially refer to as the physical world. So there is no magic here. On the contrary, it's, it's not even romantic. It's very down to earth, so to say. To me, it seems magical, but I, not in a pejorative way. It seems magical in a, in a wonder-inducing, incredible way that, that makes complete sense with what you're, you're saying. And, you know, it's, it's very similar to, to Don Hoffman's perception uh, or, uh, is a dashboard theory of perception no um, the the headset he yeah 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 the headset that he talks uh, about well the the formal name is uh, the uh, conscious agents the conscious yeah. agents theory yes 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 um i i take those to be two maybe separate things this dashboard theory of perception and the realm of conscious agents but either way they obviously he's trying to fit them together no it's the um, same thing it's and uh, it's the same thing different words um so what I actually talked to Don fairly recently, and there, there's a question I want to ask you that I know I know that you've thought really rigorously about, and, and I don't think he has thought as much about, or he at least doesn't want to go there. Um, but before we go there, there was something I wanted to ask you, because obviously this could... I, I'm not trying to throw a wrench in your gears, but I'm imagining that someone will throw this at you at some point. No, you can throw is, a wrench in my gears. No problem. It makes for well, a more interesting conversation. Did, did you hear about this news story? And admittedly, I did not look into the details of how supposedly this is happening. Just read the headline. That AI is somehow translating brain states or brain waves or brain frequencies into images of whatever the person oh, this is, is thinking old. about. Is of it? Of course. Okay, okay. okay. So, so, you know, that... I could see a physicalist neuroscientist being, what are you talking about, Bernardo? Here, see, here's your thought. Here's your thought right here. Here's this translation. Here's here's a physical representation of your thought. No, no serious neuroscience would confront me with that because he knows it's nonsense. Uh, this, is the, this is a bullshit interpretation uh, of what's going on. Look, the fact that an AI can be empirically trained to look at brain activity, your brain activity, as you're watching a film. And the AI knows both. It knows uh -huh. the contents of the film and it knows your patterns of brain activity. Of course, it can find correlations between the two. These correlations are brute facts. You do not need a theory of consciousness in order for there to be correlations. Any idealist will acknowledge immediately that there are consistent correlations between brain activity patterns and experience. Of course there are. 
Now, drink a glass of alcohol and your brain activity patterns will change along with your experience. Yeah. Now, these correlations are obvious. And the AI is simply using these brute fact, fact correlations. Now, what the idealist claims is that these correlations exist because patterns of brain activity are what my inner experiences look like when observed from across a dissociative boundary. So the image of a phenomenon correlates with the phenomenal it's the image of. Duh, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's obvious. If the phenomenon is sickness, the image of the phenomenon is how sick you look. And they will be correlated. It's obvious. You know, if the image of the phenomenon of um, oxidation, combustion, is flames, flames will correlate with the invisible microscopic process of combustion. One is the image of the other. So for the idealist, brain activity are the flames of inner experience. They are what inner experience looks like. That's why they are correlated. For the materialist, they are correlated because brain activity generates experience. But again, correlation is not causation. Now, the AI needs none of these philosophical uh, thoughts. The AI simply correlates one with the other. There is brain activity here. There is known experience there. I would train when I know what the experience is because I know what the subject is watching. It, the way this is done is you take a subject, sit him on the chair in front of a screen, and you play a movie or you show uh, snapshots, you show images, and you play sounds. At the same time, you're recording the patterns of brain activity of the subject with an MEG, EEG, or fMRI uh, mm -hmm. instrument. And you know time-wise uh, what pattern of brain activity there is given a certain image on the screen. These are, these are brute facts. These correlations are brute facts. And then you train the AI so the AI learns how patterns of brain activity correlate with the experience. Because in this case, you know the experience. You know what the yeah. subject is watching. After that, the subject goes to sleep, still instrumented with an EEG cap, say. And you measure those patterns of brain activity while the subject is sleeping. Now you're mm. not training anymore. Now you are extrapolating. Now you are inf inferring based on the earlier training. And then, of course, you can more or less accurately guess what the subject is dreaming of. Because it's more instances of the same correlations that you use during training. Does that imply that we figured out the metaphysics of mind? Of course not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, no decent neuroscientist will ever make this claim that you're worried about. And that's why no one has ever made the claim. <laughs> because you would need to be very naive uh, as a neuroscientist to arrive at this conclusion. Uh, uh, physicalism or, or other ontologies do not score points by acknowledging brute fact correlations. That's data, not, not a, a, a theoretical model. It's just yeah. data. The AI is operating on data. It doesn't need any theoretical model. Man, I, I still think that this argument's coming down the pike. Like that, yeah, the, it's, the thought is reducible to this whatever brainwave that we're measuring or, or c configuration of uh, neurons coupled with this signal. That's all it is. Like I, I could absolutely see this argument being made, but it's, oh, but the it, argument has been made before the AI stuff. It's okay. a, it's an argument yeah, right. based in print, uh, an argument made in principle. Um, but um, the AI stuff has been around for several years. I think since 2016 was the first experiment of, no, even before that, there was a first experiment in which we used a AI system to read patterns of brain activity of a sleeping subject and correctly infer more or less what the subject was dreaming of. Mm -hmm. That's based on the brute force correlation, learned brute force correlation between patterns of brain activity and experiential inner imagery. There is there is nothing. Yeah. There, uh, no serious player, even though it has been many years, no serious player has used AI uh, image extraction as an argument for physicalism. And the, the moment one does, he or she will be humiliated because it's just silly. Um, so no, don't worry about that. That uh, No serious player yeah. would do this. No. And, and this is another example too, like one of the arguments I've heard uh, John Bravacki use against reductionism. I think though, I think he said this is from the mathematician Wolfgang Smith, if I'm not mistaken, which is this 
problem that whenever you're doing a measurement and you're trying to get to the smallest possible reduced part that you know is supposedly the 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 core bit of reality you're in this relationship where you're assuming that the ruler is at least as ontologically real as the smaller thing that you're trying to measure so it's like you're in this self-defeating relationship where you're trying to get to reality by measuring the smallest possible thing but it requires the reality of the ruler to be as real or more real than the smaller thing otherwise you you're not confirming its reality you see what i'm saying i don't know if i'm doing a good job of explaining that but um do you see do you see this is a problem no i i'm saying it's a i'm saying it's a um it, it is a problem if you're trying to make the argument that look we measured the brain the, the brain state therefore that's all the brain state is it's like you're you're also in the like if you're the reductionist person the reductionist physicalist person trying to reduce reality to the brain state you're stuck in this self-defeating statement where you're saying what's real is the brain state i'm measuring but that brain state has to be measured by something that you also conceive of to be real on a higher level than the brain state itself you know what i'm saying yeah i i don't see this much as a problem to be honest with you even though i i think materialism is just laughably silly i i i don't see this particular issue as a problem because whatever reality there is to to the instruments we can touch see turn on apply whatever reality there is to it it's the same reality as the neurons in the brain that we can see touch measure know what i mean so i, I don't see any problem in saying that the reality of the measurement instrument is the same as the reality of the thing being measured um yeah, they may, yeah, they, they mean, may yeah. neither be the ultimate reality, but uh, they have the same reality in the sense that they are entities on the screen of perception, both of them. And yeah. having a relational measurement between the two seem, seems okay to me. I, I, what think, I, I think where the problem would be is if you're trying to say um, what's, what's real is the atom. We've gotten to, to core reality in this atom but you but you have to fu fundamentally agree that this like all of the other things that you're using to arrive there must also be in some important way real or you can't you're, you're using you're, you're stuck in this relationship where it has to be at least equally real where you can't reduce things down to some greater reality i think that's the statement he's trying to make is that you can't you're not getting closer to reality by getting to the smallest possible thing i agree with the conclusion um we in our culture since well maybe since the middle of the 19th century but maybe as early as the beginning of the enlightenment we there are several sort of seminal mistakes we make without being aware of it stuff we we assume in an unexamined form. One of them, and a big one, is we think of reduction as explaining the big in terms of the small. Right. And and that is fundamentally um, arbitrary. Uh, reduction should be explaining the more complex in terms of the less complex. Not the big in terms of the small, because some si what is reduction? Reduction is an explanation. And what's an explanation? It's an attempt to clarify. How do you clarify? You clarify things by starting from what's complex and going to what is simpler. That's, what, that's the point of a clarification, right? You start with something complex that you don't understand, and then you reduce that to something simpler that you do understand. That's reduction. That's explanation. Um, so fundamentally, reduction should be from the complex to the simple. Sometimes the bigger is more complex than the smaller, but there is nothing a priori etched in stone in nature saying that this is always the case, that it's right. always the case that the more complex is bigger than the less complex. The, a human brain is more complex than the Milky Way galaxy, much more complex, and it's smaller.
much smaller. So that's the mistake we make. We, we try to reduce everything to smaller elementary subatomic particles. And even though the foundations of physics have already demonstrated that uh, this is wrong, we have known since at least Feynman's uh, quantum electrodynamics uh, uh, diagrams that uh, you, if you continue the reduction, and now you have to, you know, you go from bodies to organ systems and then to tissues, cells, molecules, atoms, elementary subatomic particles, you still have to take one more step because otherwise you cannot explain a great many things. If you imagine elementary subatomic particles as little tiny marbles, indivisible marbles, like Democritus, Democritus imagined atoms, yeah, yeah. marbles of different shapes. Mm -hmm. If you stay there, then you cannot explain particle decay, you cannot explain inertia, you cannot explain gravitation, you cannot explain um, the quantum foam. Um, um, there are great many things you cannot explain. So, and to explain those, which we, we succeeded in doing with quantum electrodynamics and then its extension into quantum field theory, is that uh, you can reduce the elementary subatomic particles to fields. But now fields are the size of the cosmos. Right. See, elementary subatomic particles are ripples on fields. And those fields are the biggest thing you can possibly have because they span the entirety of the universe. And, and that's what most people, even, even solid state uh, 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 physicists, let alone biologists and social scientists and philosophers, yeah. uh, this has not yet percolated through to the other sciences, not even to the whole of physics let alone to the rest of our culture. So we still have this demonstrably false notion that uh, reduction is from the big to the small because we have already reduced the smallest things to the biggest conceivable thing by explaining elementary subatomic particles in terms of spatially unbound quantum fields. There are 17 of them today, mm. plus gravity, which we don't know how it relates to the others. Hopefully one day, uh, we will have a grand unification theory that uh, reduces everything to one hyperdimensional universal field. And there's good reasons to believe that that will be possible. There have been many attempts using superstring theory, M theory. Uh, uh, so so it, it is entirely conceivable, but, but then we have to abandon this naive notion that reduction is from the, uh, for, it, it, that reduction is from the big to the small. Reduction is from the complex to the simple. Right. And there is nothing simpler than one quantum field that spans the entire cosmos. Now, I would say that that field is a field of subjectivity yeah. because I am an idealist. And by doing that, I avoid the hard problem. I avoid conjecturing things that are not empirical givens, such as the existence of mental states, which is all we have. I avoid all that. But even if you stay metaphysically agnostic, it's still demonstrably false that we can reduce things coherently all the way from the biggest to the smallest. That doesn't, we know that doesn't work. We have known that for about a century now. It's just that this knowledge has not percolated through the culture. That was very clearly put, Bernardo. It's, it's interesting because I've sometimes when I'm, you know, doing research and listening to other conversations of yours or listening to other people talk about you, sometimes they'll say things like, I, I'm not foundationally sure. I know he's an idealist, but I don't know foundationally what he believes. I feel like that snippet right there is a great, just very clear, not complex um, example. And I think, so So now this is a good segue for for going where I wanted to go before. We were talking about the, the cockpit dashboard of perception or, you know, akin to Don's headset theory. And the question that I asked him was, when we are seeing anomalous phenomena occurring, like uh, like a topic that we talked about last time that I know you're really interested in, all the stuff that's going on with UAPs and anomalous phenomena finally being acknowledged by the power holders as real, as something that's actively being studied, potentially being reverse engineered. But in terms of the anomalous behavior that seems to defy the quote unquote laws of physics could what 
could part of what is anomalous be the limitations of our dashboard, like the limitations of the headset, so that we are seeing something that is real in, in some ontological way, but we don't have whatever you want to call it, the evolved senses or the, the necessary instruments to sense whatever that is. Is, is that how you think about it? Um, I, I could say yes, but of course there's a lot more to, to what's going on now. I'll shortly be publishing, um, a, a long essay with a sort of summary of my ideas about uh, the UAP phenomenon and also Fabulous. the contactee and the, the, the abduction phenomenon, high strangeness and all that stuff. Um, because I have been trying to make a contribution to this field for the past six months uh, or so. Um, so I'll be publishing an essay in which I'll summarize this. Um, I already published a book years ago called Meaning and Absurdity, in which I directly addressed mm. the high strangeness subset of the phenomenon, cool, uh, which cool. I'm not sure is the same as the UAPs you know, stored in hangars and, and the yeah. biologic, biologic stored in freezers. I don't know whether those two phenomena are the same phenomena. Right. I'm very inclined to think they are not. Uh, and uh, that we are mistakenly conflating two different things, one artificial and the other one natural. We are conflating them together be because of this arbitrary label we attach to both of them called alien. Right. And so, and, and the origin of this label is that um, we have this epistemic arrogance, naive arrogance, to think that whatever happens on planet Earth, we we already figured it out. We figured out the planet. We know everything there is to know about the dynamics, behavior, and, and contents of this planet. And therefore, if there is something coming up that doesn't fit with our understanding of the planet, then it has to be extraterrestrial. Then it has to be alien. And lo and behold, both the high strangeness phenomenon, the contactee, abductee, all that stuff, which I take seriously, not literally, um, both that phenomenon and the UAPs that violates the laws of physics, they seem to violate our understanding of the planet. So yeah. we attach the label alien to both, which leads us to conflate what is probably two different things um, into the same category. And that will prevent progress in understanding it. Because if you put an apple and a, and a banana in the same box, there is no way you will be able to account for the two of them with the same explanation because they're bloody different. Right, right, right. So no explanation will fit them without some form of contradiction, right? So uh, an important step in figuring these things out is to uh, establish a proper categorization of what we are dealing with without conflation. Now we stand a better chance of coming up with an account that doesn't inherently have contradictions because we separated things that are different. So I'll be publishing that essay. Um, I don't think I can give you an answer in five minutes uh, that that will sort of, you know, encompass the whole thing. Maybe people watching this in the future, maybe the essay is already published, you know, and there is already a link somewhere on my website or my social media pointing to it. Um, what I will tell you is that um, having been very deeply involved in the field, for several months now, um, it's not a field I want to stay in. Mm. Uh, and the reason for that is not that I am cavalier about the or dismissive about the phenomenon. No, I think the phenomenon or the phenomena are real and they are very important if we are to progress with our understanding of nature and what's going on, our understanding of who we are, our role in the intellectual hierarchy of this planet. I can anticipate to you that I think neither of the two phenomena I alluded to are extraterrestrial. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on this. I'm with you on this. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very warm to the sort of, you know, quote unquote, ultra terrestrial sort of explanation, but I'm also very warm to, and we talked a bit about this last time too something more akin to Jung's understanding of UFOs in that we we may be witnessing almost like a some kind of 
visually present synchronicity or something like that in that to, to approach this from a slightly different angle. I, I was watching a video recently. I'm not hundred percent sure what video it was, but where they were talking about that, I, I think this was in project blue book when they were researching all of this stuff that they did have to admit that weird, high weirdness, high strangeness seems to run together. A lot of these supposed UFO cases are flanked by other weird shit, sort of like, you know, um, you know, like That's, the book is uh, skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Yeah. That's why they say this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what do you do with that? One theory is, I think what I posited to you in the beginning is that, yeah, it all runs together because it's the headset being like, I, I guess it's this, you know, I, I guess I'll show you this because it's, you, you can't, you can't comprehend it for whatever reason. So I'll show it to you as this, you know, that, that to me feels like a potentially plausible explanation. And it also, I think, um, you know, and, and this may be out there for some people, but there's a huge overlap here with the psychedelic experience in that you see this kind of epistemological flailing that occurs where the the high weirdness, the, the mysterium tremendum you encounter through that experience is you're so unable to capture it in any model that you have that you come out the other side with a story about what it was like i saw jesus i saw whatever but if you could return to the space you were actually in it, it it's something so much bigger than that and so much more dynamic and that that it's it transcends just any label that you can put on it so you do your best and you just slap that over it it's almost like the these i i guess what we could collectively call paranormal things are are almost like the headset just being like i i don't know what to put on it so i'll give you this <laughs> yeah we <laughs> look we we are primates yeah. and we evolved a cognitive system that is suitable to fitness in other words it helps us survive and reproduce that's what evolution by natural selection did in putting together our cognitive system our ability to perceive and understand what's happening around us um but of course, this cognitive system was optimized for fitness and not to pick out what is philosophically salient. Yeah. In other words, our cognitive system was not made to understand reality. It was made to enable survival and reproduction. Um, but because that's the only cognitive system we have, it constitutes the only template we can apply to the world in order to understand the world. Now, it's not a suitable template. It's a limiting, distorted, biased template, but it's all we have. It's all we can do. And the moment we apply that template to our understanding of the world, we are projecting ourselves and our, our cognitive structures onto the world. And once we project those, of course, the world reflects itself back to us according to the structures we projected onto it. Mm -hmm. We see our own image in the mirror, so to say. Yeah. And then that leads us to the naive assumption that we have universal cognitive systems. In other words, we think that our narratives about what nature is are actually what nature is. Right, right, right. <laughs> as opposed to our skewed, distorted apprehension of what nature is according to a cognitive system that was made for survival and not for understanding the salient points of reality. Now, so that's the unexamined assumption we make. We think that we have universal cognitive systems as opposed to limited, distorted, biased, mm -hmm. uh, uh, screwed up cognitive systems as far as apprehending what's going on. And, uh, and then we project that onto all other possible intelligences. We think that all other possible intelligences will be thinking in the way we do along the same categories that we use to carve out the world in order to make sense of it. We think that alien intelligences, and when I say alien, I don't mean extraterrestrial, a whale is an alien intelligence. Yeah. Um, we think that alien, alien intelligences will cognitively 
process things in the same way, along the same patterns, with the same categories uh, through which we process things. If that were true, we could translate our languages to one another, just like a Chinese translates to English or an, English, an Englishman translates to Chinese. And we think that English and Chinese are so different that we then extrapolate the concept of translation to speaking in an alien language. And that's incredibly naive because when you're translating a human language onto another, what you're presupposing there is that the underlying cognitive systems are identical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just the words and grammatical structures, syntactical structures that differ. Maybe not even the grammatic structures differ. You know, there are people out there, linguists like Noam Chomsky, who say all humans have the same universal grammar. Universal in the sense of all humans, not in the sense of other species. Um, so we presuppose a lot of commonality when we speak of translation. It's incredibly naive to think that we could translate to a non-human intelligence because their cognitive system is different and therefore they experience a different world than, than we do because what they experience is their cognition of nature, not what nature is in and right. of itself. Just as what we experience is our cognition of nature according to our categories, our human biased archetypes, our... Um, syntactical and semantical preferences, so to say, as defined by our biology, by our physiology. Um, so if a truly non-human intelligence is to communicate with us, it's not going to happen through translation. What it's going to happen is that either they have to gain direct access to our cognitive space, so to see the world through our eyes and use our conceptual library, yeah. our cognitive templates. Or we have to do the same with them. We have to enter their cognitive space and see the world through their eyes and construct a message for them based on their cognitive building blocks, their conceptual categories, their grammars, not ours. And that's exactly how the Jungian unconscious communicates to the ego. You know, people ask, well, why are dreams so difficult to interpret? Yeah. Why doesn't the unconscious just say something in English? Well, then that was Jung's answer. Obviously, it can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because the unconscious is an atavistic, a primitive layer of mind that does not have these higher level conceptual mental functions that we do. So not only can it not speak a language, it cannot speak any language that could be translatable into English. All it can do is communicate symbolically to access our conceptual categories, our grammars, and then construct metaphorical, symbolic stories using our cognitive building blocks, which convey meaning indirectly to us. When the unconscious does that, we call it a dream. And nobody takes dreams literally, we are trying to find what is the underlying meaning of a dream. Like, I use this example in the essay, still to be published. Um, suppose you are procrastinating and you are wasting time. Time's passing and you're wasting time, you're procrastinating. You're not going with your life where nature wants you to go, where you deeply want you to go. But you're not aware of it because you're too busy having fun and procrastinating. You're not aware of it. So the unconscious feels that. And your unconscious now will try to communicate to your executive ego and convey this sense of urgency. Yeah. How can the unconscious do that? By telling you, get your act together, you're procrastinating. Time is flowing and you're wasting time. Look how many abstractions there are, there are in this. Time, it's an abstraction. Where is time? Can you hand it to me? Can you give me time? Put it in my hands. It's an abstraction. Flow is an abstraction. A river flows time flows, you can have a flow of ideas, the flow of consciousness, you can be in the flow. All these are different flows. Flow is an abstraction. So all of these abstractions and concepts and categories are anchored in the human grammar, the human cognitive system. They cannot be translated. So what the unconscious does, it uses our egoic cognitive categories to convey meaning indirectly. And it may give you a dream in which you're on a hike and you accidentally drop your uh, backpack on a fast-flowing river 
and then you watch your backpack flow away with your computer and your wallet inside, and you have that sense, I have to immediately run after it. I am wasting time. Yeah. I am procrastinating. I may lose my backpack. Now that's the message. Yes. And yeah. it's conveyed indirectly in symbolic, in metaphorical form, but it evokes the same targeted meaning, which is you must feel a sense of urgency. Yeah, that's the right. meaning. It's not a back, backpack flowing in a river during a hike and you watching it flow away helplessly. No, that's not the message. The message is the underlying meaning, the underlying feeling it evokes, which is you're wasting time. Yeah, you know, yeah, you should yeah. have a sense of urgency. So a non-human intelligence, because just like the unconscious, lacks the categories and the, the grammars, you know, the, the cognitive structure of the human ego, for it to communicate with us, it would have to communicate with us just as the unconscious does. It would have to communicate with us in the form of metaphorical, symbolic dreams and visions. And lo and behold, apparently that's exactly what happens. Should anybody be surprised? No, no. If, if whales were telepathic, that's how they would communicate with us. They would implant or sort of modulate dreams so we can tell their message to ourselves using our own conceptual and grammatic categories because they don't have those categories. So you would have to use our own. And, and the message would appear to us not as somebody talking to you, but as you having a nonsensical vision, like a dream which we are all tempted to discard afterwards in, instead of just looking a little deeper to see what is the actual meaning that one is trying to convey. Um, if if um, praying mantises were to try to communicate with us, the dreams would be even stranger than the dreams mm -hmm. that the telepathic whales uh, yeah. would try to modulate in our own minds. But whatever the case for communication between two different intelligent species with different cognitive systems to happen, each would have to use the conceptual and grammatical and cognitive structure of the other. Right. In other words, each would have to implant a vision in the other if they have the technology or the skill to do so. And apparently that's what's happening. <laughs> Man, and I mean, just to, just to throw. Out, see, see, this is this is what's meant by, you know, how they they throw around in in some of those docu pieces of documentation that have come to light, like like declassified documents. They throw around this term ontological shock. Like, if we let people know that this is real, it could result in ontological shock. And usually, people characterize that as world's religions, people's ability to know what's real, where they fall within reality. This is the ontological shock. It's like, that's just the beginning. Like the, you're, you're, the, the ontological shock just continues to ripple outward because if something like this is real, the implications are, are in that, like you don't know even where the borders of your ability to make sense of reality extend to. Because I just had this crazy idea when you were talking of, what if whatever this is has a completely different mental system? And what if they had different archetypes somehow? Like, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I believe this, but what if their subset of primordial images is different than ours? And we would have right. to like translate primordial image templates. Like you can't even begin to wrap your mind around how weird this could get. It could no, get- they would, evoke, they would evoke our own primordial images. Yeah, they they would have to, or we and, would... and 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 that and that could be even very natural, because what we take to be language and narrative and even even visual storytelling um, is a coating on a much more atavistic set of mental states that uh, that embody meaning directly. In other words, mental states that are not pointed to something else, the way words mm -hmm. pointing to something else. You know, if you see the letters T R E E, those letters are not a tree. Right. They point to a tree, but the tree is something else. And the tree may be a symbol for something else. It may be a symbol for growth. And growth may be right. a symbol for right. evolution. And evolution may be a symbol for time. You can't keep on doing this forever. At some point, you have to reach 
rock bottom. You have to reach a mental state that's not pointing to anything else. It's the direct embodiment of felt meaning, right? Um, so all of our narratives and words and stories and theories and models and concepts, it's just a, a layered coating on top of a direct meaning embodying mental state. Yeah. Now, those meaning embodying mental states evoke the layers on top of them very naturally because that's how mind works. Mind works through similarities, correspondences of form and meaning. Um, before we, we are taught theory and language, uh, we associate things that are similar. Yeah, yeah. Not similar in terms of color and form alone, but similar in terms of semantics, in terms of the meaning they evoke. And that's why the ancients always spoke in terms of metaphors. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, that's why you would say time flows. That's a metaphor. Time doesn't flow. Where is time? I, I don't see time flowing. Do you see? I on, I'm, I'm always ever only in the present. I don't experience this flow of time, but there is something we metaphorically refer to as the flow of time. So that's a layer that goes on top of a sort of a, a primitive, not in the sense of bad, but in the sense of primordial, irreducible uh, mental state that embodies its own meaning and doesn't connote or denote or point to anything else. They will have those primordial mental states. These primordial man mental states are universal yeah. because they embody meaning themselves. They don't need to be translated. Um, it's, it's reasonable to think that the mere proximity or interaction of their primordial meaning states with our mental states would lead to the evocation in our minds, according to our conceptual categories, of a story, a narrative, a vision that embodies the, that, that primordial meaning. In other words, it wouldn't require engineering and effort. All you would need is an interaction between their primary meaning embodying mental states with our mind. Because mind, since it works by analogy, it will immediately and very naturally seek for the closest similarity between that felt meaning, because it's a primordial meaning state we are being exposed to. We feel its meaning directly. Yeah. It resonates with our own primordial uh, primitive meaning states. The moment that resonance happens, our own mind takes care of building a symbolic narrative on top of it so the ego can tell itself what it is that it has just comprehended. Right. See? Yeah. They don't need to engineer this, this symbolic construction in us because this symbolic construction has to happen with our cognitive structures and conceptual uh, dictionary. Yes, okay. Which they don't share, so yeah, they yeah. can't do that. And they don't need to do that. All they need to do is to expose us to the bare form of their meaning embodying mental states. And our minds will take care, take care of the rest automatically, naturally. The problem is that it will do so in the form of metaphorical visions that may be contradictory, vague, difficult yeah. to understand, and the ego has a tendency to then dismiss them. Yes. Which is what we almost always do. But if the ego doesn't dismiss them and sort of sits with them, just, just, just be with it. For a few days, just be with it, open-minded. Don't go malarkey. Don't don't go flaky. Think that you know blue aliens from the Pleiades are sending you heart <laughs> vibrations. Right. It, it's metaphorical stuff. Just sit with the metaphor for a few days and see what it does to you. Um, that's what I would try to do if I if I had an encounter. I had one. I had an encounter once when I was a kid. Uh, but most people don't do that. Most people seek for the literal thing. Play, uh, aliens from the Pleiades stimulating heart vibrations or whatever new age nonsense there is right, around right. Uh, this stuff. Um, I think this is much closer to home than we think. Uh, I think um, the alien is the whale. The alien is the praying mantis. Or maybe a very intelligent species that evolved on Earth 300 million years ago built an entire civilization, no sign of which we will see today because of erosion, earth tectonics that recycles uh, and reforges uh, the earth's crust regularly every tens of millions of years. Uh, maybe some of them survived hidden in, you know, underground or under the ocean because they may have some trauma related to the end of their civilization wow. by natural stuff that can end our civilization like comet and asteroid impact 
a climate collapse, uh, uh, solo, solar, ionizing solar storms that destroy technology, great floods, uh, any of those things could, add, could have ended their civilization without ending all of them and all of their technology. Um, but they can be as terrestrial as, as we are and as aliens to, our, as, to us as a whale or a praying mantis. None of this is extraterrestrial. Does it need to be? Yeah. Why would it be? Yeah, you can, you can get quite exotic while staying right at home. But I think to try to, try to square this circle, um, which I don't know if we can do, between how we entered here in terms of me asking, could these things be like the limitation of, of our instrumentation to sense reality encountering something that we have no barometer for. Do you think that this means to understand this phenomenon in a way that makes some level of epistemic sense? We have to look beyond the dashboard and go into the mental more deeply using a more like Jungian method or a more, um, I don't know, med meditative, introspective, potentially even like, you know, esoteric modality of course the the dashboard has evolved to allow us to survive not to pick out what is metaphysically or spiritually or any other aspect uh, relevant to us um, if we understand that the world we see the colloquially physical world the stuff we see here touch smell taste if we understand that all this is just a dashboard representation and that behind the colloquially, colloquially physical world, there is the real world, then automatically we will have to accept that the real world has many more degrees of freedom than the dashboard. Now, a, a dashboard of an airplane can represent a lightning storm outside with its clouds and high winds and thunder, thunder electric discharge, discharges. It can represent that in a couple of relevant dials, enough for you to survive flying through the electrical storm or around it. But of course, the degrees of freedom of the storm are much higher than the little scales of the moving dials on the dashboard. You have many, many, many more degrees of freedom in the real world than in the representation, mm. dashboard representation of the real world. And why is that? Well, it's necessarily so because the more degrees of freedom the dashboard has, the more difficult it becomes to interpret and manage it. Flight manu manuals would be the size of the Library of Congress if an airplane's dashboard had anywhere near the same degrees of freedom of a storm. You would have to have a different instruction for the pilot depending on each different possible configuration of a storm cloud, which is like countless. Yeah. Do they matter for your ability to fly properly through the storm? No, you don't need to know the exact configuration of air pressure and water right. molecules. In the, you don't need to know. You can average all of that out in a number, in one dial indication that is enough for you to survive the storm. That's the physical world. It's that one dial indication with many, many, many less degrees of freedom than the real world. However, if you have evolved enough to understand what I just said, and then to hack your dashboard yes, and gain more access to those extra degrees of freedom that are out there, then goodness knows what you can do. It will look magical to us in exactly the same sense that if we go, say, to the most intelligent person of 200 years ago, 1824, who was the wisest, most intelligent person on earth, I would say it was the great Goethe. Yeah. Maybe there were others more intelligent that we don't know about, or that, at least that I don't know about. Now, imagine that I would go back in time and hand my iPhone to the great Goethe and allow him not only to try to reverse engineer it himself, but to take it to the University of Vienna, where, where the greatest minds of the time were, and build a group and try to make sense of my mobile phone. Will he succeed? Of course he will not because there is a degree of freedom that does not show up directly on our dashboard. It's called electromagnetism. You don't see electromagnetism, you only see its effects. The electromagnetic field permeates everything, permeates you 
the entire world around you. That's why radio waves can go across a vacuum. Radio waves are oscillations. They are waves, things that go up and down. How can they cross a vacuum? It's a vacuum. There's nothing going up and down. How can a wave cross a vacuum, right? It's a hack of the dashboard. It's only in the dashboard that there is a vacuum. In the real world, it's not a vacuum. We have gained access to that extra degree of freedom through theoretical abstraction, through Faraday's fields mm -hmm. and Maxwell's mm -hmm. equations, both of which were developed in the, uh, no, Faraday was in the 1830s. So just we are still just in time. Goethe would still not have known of any of that. Now, he would think our mobile phone, you know, it can play chess against it. It speaks to you in natural language like a person. Uh, it displays amazing graphics. It has an answer for everything. Magical, magical. Right. And yet he was the most intelligent person. And this all was only 200 years ago. Seven generations, yeah. seven generations, you know, Maybe there are parts of my family that are, that are already documented. I can find the documentation of someone in my family that was alive at that time. Imagine what a species a million years ahead of us, a terrestrial species that evolved here, maybe succumbed as a civilization to a great cataclysm, is traumatized about the surface of the planet because the surface is very exposed. It's just about the worst place to be. It went inside the house and allowed the monkeys to wreak havoc on the roof. Here we are. We are the monkeys. We are on the roof. Um, if they were to, by chance, drop one of their iPhones here, we would be completely discombobulated because yeah. they will have found more of this real but invisible degrees of freedom that don't show up on the dashboard than we have. And for us, Dash stuff would be as magical as my iPhone would be to Goethe only 200 years ago. Actually, much stranger, much more incomprehensible and, and discombobulating. None of these requires supernatural stuff or aliens from the Pleiades. It can all be nature on planet Earth. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I have no doubt that as time passes technology will continue to evolve 200 years from now i'm sure we'll have things that would look magical from the vantage point of 2024 um but my my leading question was going somewhere to the effect of does that type of knowledge only extend so far in terms of like yeah you you really could think of it as you know where you at the highest level, and this is what someone like Penrose would say, at the highest level, the human logos is able to reach beyond its dashboard using what we call mathematics. And, and we can use the language of mathematics to pull down higher truths from the realm of forms. And we can translate that into technology over long periods of time. And that's one of the things that makes human beings special. So that that's one way to look at it. And in that way, it is sort of like, Girdle's incompleteness theorem sort of sense, there's no end to what you could bring down. It's just, there'd always be more, always be more to discover. But is there, you know, with something like what we're witnessing where, you know, quote unquote, soft UFOs of like things that are even captured on camera look like they're breaking apart, going back together, morphing, becoming different shapes. Like, it's hard for me to believe that something like that could be fashioned out of materials like it almost seems like you're you're right you're on the edge of where solidity like, like it's it's like almost psychoid you know it's like it's like this this thing or, or it's the it's like it's 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 something mercurial it's like it's <laughs> hermetic in the actual sense of like it's dancing on the border of 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 things that humans can't do or, or something, but we just barely have the ability to perceive. And th that's where I was going with, is there some kind of way that this is only going to make sense to us if we somehow marry the mental with whatever that, that effort of, that I described of, of what has become the normal way of rendering technology of like, 
uh, math and technology and man hours and experimentation. Do, do you think we could get to that kind of a point given enough oh, time? Sure. Or? Yeah. Uh, look, our division between the mental and the physical is purely arbitrary. It's, it's an artifact of this cultural moment, which has been going on for about 200 years now. Um, but it, it, it's going to die very soon because it, 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 mm. it doesn't survive reason and evidence, this, this, this separation between the mental and the physical and, and, and the bizarre attempt to avoid the separation by reducing the mental to the physical when the obvious clue that nature gives us is that you should do the other way around because mental states are, are what you start from to try right. to reduce the mental to an abstract, purely quantitative physical is a fool's errand. And we are engaged with it, but not for long. This, this ends before half, the half of this century is upon us. It's already ending uh, right now. Mm. Um, I wish I could speak more to, to, what I, to the reasons I have for saying what I said, but f for now, I, 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 I can't. And not because it's top secret, but it's just respect um, for people's um, confidence uh, so of course they they would not be limited by this peculiar and rather silly uh, idea we have now about the nature of reality that trying to sort of reduce our, our own mental states away into something purely abstract yeah. it's like a, a dog chasing its own tail because you know matter outside mind is an abstraction of the human mind which then tries to reduce itself to its own abstraction it's mm -hmm. like mind chasing its own tail or like um, a painter painting a self-portrait and then declaring that uh, he is his self-portrait. And then he has to account for his mind in terms of a pattern of pigment distribution on canvas, which right. is, of course, silly beyond belief. But we are lost in this because we are young. Um, if you postulate a civilization capable of the technology that we are led to believe is is out there, uh, of course, they will not be stuck at this point. The, for them, mind and physicality are, are are one and the same thing, and their technology will not be limited by this artificial boundary. They will walk all across this boundary as if it was as if it were not there. Why? B because it's not there. <laughs> it's a, it's our own. Uh, uh, fallacious projection onto things. It's our own misunderstanding of what's going on. So the mental phase of the UAP phenomenon uh, is a different category only insofar as we try to understand it because we project our categories onto what we see. Yeah. So we see, well, the UAP has a measurable physical phase, but it can directly affect human cognition. So it's a different phase. No, it's one and the same thing. It's, it, it, there is only one reality. And it, it is mental, and it is the other type of mental stuff that we give the name physical to. But it's all mental. So they will explore the, the extra degrees of freedom you get if you don't impose this artificial division between the mental and the physical. Now, um, the behavior you described, yeah, I think what you're trying to say is that their behavior is illogical to us. The way they move is illogical. They merge and split and go in different directions and zigzag around for no reason. There are two possible answers to that. One is, it is logical, but we don't see the logic. Right. It's like the, the randomness you is, talked about before. Like, it, scheming yeah. quantum randomness may indeed not be random. We just lack a big enough aperture to to apprehend the sense. Yeah. Yeah. Randomness is a malformed concept. Uh, it, you, you cannot define randomness in a way that is not internally contradictory. Randomness it stands for we don't understand it. Yes. <laughs> when we say it's random, what we are actually saying is we don't understand it. We can't predict it. It's not a quality of the world. It's a limitation of our own epistemology, our own cognition. But okay, one possibility is that it is logical, but we don't see it. Let me give you an example. I already wrote about it. Um, we think we see the world around us in high resolution, right? You look at the screen and you see my face in high resolution. And now you think that you see the rest of the screen in high resolution. And you think you see everything around your screen in high resolution. Now, that's an illusion. The only thing we see in high resolution is the light that hits the center of the retina. 
And the size of that is about a thumbnail at an arm's length away. Hmm. This is what we see in high resolution. It's a tiny, tiny circle in the center of our visual field. Everything else is blurred, out of focus, very low resolution. Why do we think we see everything in high resolution? It's because we um, autonomously, uh, no, our autonomous mind does that, materialists would say our brain does this, we scan our visual field with very subtle zigzagging eye movements. We are always zigzagging around and our memory retains the high resolution little circle that we acquired when we were looking at these different points across our visual field. We zigzag with our eyes, but we don't notice it because mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. it's an autonomous function. It doesn't need to be under the control of the executive ego. The ego can think thoughts and feel emotions without having to explicitly control the zigzagging eye movement. But our eyes are moving illogically, seemingly illogically. It's not illogical at all. They're just scanning the visual field to construct this illusion of a complete high-resolution image which is not there. It's never there. We do not see high resolution except for this tiny little circle in the center of our visual field. Now, keep this in mind. Now I tell something different and it will converge. I'll go back to what I just said. Um, The way we control our technology is still based on the paradigm of buttons and screens. In other words, we have to interact with our technology through the intermediation of tactile stuff. We have to press button, move levers, uh, or or slide our fingers on a touch-sensitive screen. Now, there there, there is already technology that um, tries to enable you to control the character of of a video game with Mm -hmm, thought mm -hmm. waves. So they put a little EEG yeah. thing on your on your head, and you can control something without using your hands, yeah. without using your fingers. We already have that technology. Mm-hmm. Now, then we have now that company that's trying to insert implants into our brain yeah, neural in order yeah. to m- measure our mental activity with more accuracy than an external EEG cap could. Now, extrapolate this. When you extrapolate this and you tie this up with genetic engineering, which CRISPR technology now gives us complete freedom to do. We just don't do it because we don't know what to do and we don't know how to do it safely, but we we know how to do it. We could change entire genomes with CRISPR technology. We can edit Mm -hmm. it like you edit text. We are just very careful because we don't understand how the genome quite works yet. So we are not going to go edit it human genomes at will, but we do that with worms, aquatic worms, and, and, and drosophila or, or fruit flies, cells, single-cell single, single cell organisms. Now, what would this end up? It will end up in a situation where we engineer an organism that is directly coupled to its technology. Yeah, wow. That's what we <laughs> would do, right? Yeah. Now, what would happen? Now, that technology is your eye. And yeah. if you zigzag, like you zigzag your eyes, you will zigzag a UAP. Yeah. Yeah. So when you put you it that way, I mean? yeah, yeah. When you put it that way, we're like one Jack Parsons away from something like this. And what I mean by that is, you know, Jack Parsons was this uh, famous um, jet propulsion engineer who was also into the occult and was worked for NASA and wound up blowing himself up. Um while also being like an adherent of Alistair Crowley. I, I say this because it's like, we're one esoteric weirdo with the requisite knowledge of computer science and genetics away from like having a bunch of money and going and playing with these things until something like this may come out of that guy's lab. You know, like, because we we have all of the theoretical pieces. Someone just needs to put them together and play with them for a while. And yeah, yeah I, mean, I think if you if you're dealing with an advanced enough intelligence, the distinction between what they are and their technology will be less marked as it is for us. In other words, yeah, 
biology and technology will start to merge. So it's almost th like the, the homunculus of, of alchemy that exists. It's like like we, we, we really are on the verge of being able to make something like that. It, it seems like you really like the way. esoteric. Uh, I, I always do. I always do. A clear <laughs> <of it. laughs> well, as long as you're picking up what I'm putting down, then. No, I understand yeah. you. Um, so this is an example of a behavior that is logical but we don't perceive it as logical because we don't understand what's actually going on. What's actually going on is that that UAP is connected to an intelligence as a sort of an extension of that intelligence's organism. And that intelligence is just scanning the territory like our eyes scan our territory. It's yeah. directly controlled by the subconscious mind of that intelligence, just like our eye movements are subconsciously controlled mm -hmm. by our own mind. So it's not illogical, it just seems to be. Now, there is another layer, and that's more subtle now, and you see this in the so-called abductee or contactee yeah. phenomenon. And that's the translogical behavior. That's when it really does not comply with the five axioms of our logic, our Aristotelian logic, that tells us, for instance, that every statement must be either true or false, yeah. not both and not neither. Or, or that states that if A is identical to B and B is identical to C, then A is identical to C. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have five Aristotelian axioms of logic, none of which can be proven because you cannot logically prove the validity of logic without circular reasoning. You see what I mean? Yeah, philosophers yeah, right. say without begging the question. So if you try to logically prove the validity of logic, you are already using logic, that which you are trying to prove, as part of your proof. It's circular reasoning. It's like saying the Bible is true because God wrote it and God exists because the Bible says so. Right, 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 right. You see, it's circular reasoning. Um, so without circular, it's impossible to prove the validity of our logic because any attempt to do so would be circular. This is formally called Agrippa's trilemma mm. or Munchausen's trilemma. Uh, part of that trilemma is that you cannot prove the validity of logic. We use the logic because for us it's self-evident. It requires no proof. Anybody agrees that these five axioms are true. Why does everybody agree with it? Because we all have the same cognitive system. And for something to be self-evidently true for us is a function of our cognitive system. It's our cognitive system that finds those things self-evidently true. If you have a different cognitive system, what is self-evident to us is not self-evident to that other cognitive system, obviously, yeah, right? Yeah. The obviousness of a truth is a function of the cognitive system that evaluates the question. So if you have a different cognitive system, you have different logic axioms. And they are not less valid than in ours. They are as self-evident to them as ours are to us. Yes. And both are arbitrary. Both are empirically useful. The world seems to behave as though logic were true. Not always, though, as quantum mechanics has found out. Um, but both are fundamentally arbitrary, even though they have massive empirical applications. And yet they can be different. So... There is this second layer in which their behavior, but that's more on the mental side of things, not the nuts and bolts uh, UAP thing, more on the abduction and contactee phenomenon. You see this translogical behavior, which may reflect just a difference in the axioms of logic used by whatever the agency behind those visions um, is. Yeah. This third possibility is that there is no logic involved at all. So just to re recapitulate, the first possibility is there is a logic, it's the same as ours, but we are still unable to see that logic, like the moving of the eye. The second possibility is that there is a logic, but it's not the same as ours, because logic as an axiomatic thing depends on the particular cognitive system in question. Yeah, yeah. And they, ha they will have one different from ours. Just like my cat has a different uh, cognitive system than mine. <clears throat> and the third possibility is there is no logic because it's not needed. When you're trying to convey archetypal meaning, like dreams try to convey to us, there is no need for logic. 
because you don't need a internally consistent narrative to convey a certain insight, a certain intuition, or a certain feeling. What you want is to evoke that insight, yeah. that intuition, that feeling. The means you, you, you use in that attempt to evoke, they don't need to be illogical, so long as they still evoke their intended meaning. That's what mythology does. That's what symbolism does. That's what metaphor does. That's what your dreams do. Your dreams are not logically consistent. Stuff appears no. and disappears or suddenly pops in another place. It's completely internally inconsistent. But if you wake up immediately after an illogical dream, you will wake up with a certain impression, a certain feeling <coughs> that may even inform your life. And the meaning resides in that impression, that feeling, that intuition, that insight you just had, even though the means to evoke that in you were completely logical. So the third possibility, and that has to do with communication, not with behavior that we happen to observe because we happen to be at the right place at the right time, but when there is an explicit attempt to communicate, no logic is needed because the attempt is to evoke something in us. If they manage to do that, then they achieve their goal, even if the message itself or the metaphor or the symbolism, the means to an end, even if that is logically inconsistent internally, it doesn't matter. What matters is that it evokes the right thing. Yeah, I, I follow. I follow. It kind of reminds me of, um, there's this book called The Dream in the Underworld by James Hillman. I don't know if you've come across this one, but it's one of the few James Hillman books I have not okay. read yet. Well, it, it's interesting because- It's he, a late one, right? I, I actually thought it was earlier, but I could be wrong about that. Um, I think it's the late 70s. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, so he he essentially is positing, you know, he's trying to go further than Jung. I, and I can't, I can't get into all this with <laughs> being this, as far into this as we are. But just to really nutshell it, he's trying to go further than Jung in saying, what if dreams... <laughs> are not compensatory in that it's the unconscious and the conscious kind of, you know, do, doing this compensatory uh, relationship where they're communicating with one another and you're taking something back into the daylight. What if rather it really is a noumena, like an outer noumena coming, coming to you and you're making a mistake by trying to turn it into something for you where you, your job is to mentate on the image and understand that you really were were glimpsing something that is there in the same way where he, he uses this metaphor when you see a mountain you don't say what does the mountain mean for me he's he's saying in in a dream stick with the image don't try to turn the the image into something for you stick to the image as representative of something real and the reason he calls it the dream in the underworld is that you really could think of it like you're you're kind of in the inside out. You're in the the realm of the mental or the underworld when you're in the dream realm, and it's just as real as your day realm. And don't try to turn it into something real by bringing it into the day realm or into the ego. Let it be what it is, and understand that it's not yours. It's just something that you saw. And it's I, I don't fully know how I feel about it, but it's it, it's a fun exercise to do it's one of the tenets of archetypal psychology which is critics would say it's a it's a, an attempt to romanticize analytical psychology but i think there's more to it to humans work which i enjoy by the way me too um I, I tend to like his favorites yeah yeah i i like his early work a lot uh, emotions uh, suicide you know the stuff mm -hmm. he wrote in the early 60s and he was a young man, just married and just graduated from the, the, the Young Institute. Um, <clears throat> I think both are right. There is no reason for us to, to make an either or decision here. I think some dreams are clearly meant to the ego as uh, a compensatory attempt from the lower, more primitive, but broader layers of our minds, and some are not. 
some sim simply reflect those older, lower layers doing what they do. And sometimes we pick into it from the ego's point of view. Yeah. Um, why I think that some are interpretable as being meant to us is that um, we are a way the unconscious is manifesting itself. It manifests itself through us. <clears throat> And the unconscious is a mind. The word unconscious is a misnomer. Yeah. It only means that it's not associated and metacognitive. It doesn't mean that it doesn't entail experience. It is experiential. So it's conscious in that sense, but it's not metacognitive associated consciousness. Jung is clear in the way he defines the unconscious uh, over different um, works um, in, around yeah, the beginning of his late life in the 1930s, he sort of pins down that definition. But let's continue to use the word Jung used and Freud, uh, the unconscious and human as well. If the unconscious, if, if what we are is an attempt of the unconscious mind to express itself through the higher layers that we evolved with higher level mental functions, such as you know, metacognition, self-awareness, the ability to think symbolically or, or conceptually, the ability to have language. All of this evolved on top of the core of the unconscious mind, which is an ancient mind, an yeah. atavistic mind, yeah. mind of instinct. But instinct, instinct can be driven. It is goal-oriented. So these more recent layers that evolved on top and which we identify with, we call it the ego, from the point of view of the ancient unconscious, they are, they should be doing the unconscious uh, bidding. You see? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when the ego doesn't do the unconscious uh, bidding, the unconscious tries to communicate with the ego and, and sort of set it right. Because our actions impact not only our ego, but they impact the unconscious as well. Some of our psychological crisis states, such as depression, ennui, meaninglessness, anxiety, they have a direct bearing on the unconscious. The unconscious suffers along. It's one mind. It's mm. multiple layers, but ultimately, it's one mind. The un unconscious collects the, the trash we throw its way. You know, you know, keep on throwing trash in the way of the unconscious, all the stuff we repress, all the desires we don't listen to, all characteristics of ourselves that we reject, that we don't want to think of ourselves as having those characteristics. Yeah. We shove all of that crap towards the unconscious. And what the unconscious is trying to express through us, often we deny expressing that because we follow our little rational plans about what our life should be about, money, you know, a beautiful wife, a house, three three kids and a dog, uh, power, influence, fame, uh, to be rich in fame. Like a lot of people say, that's the meaning of life. That, that's foreign language for the unconscious. Yeah. The unconscious is incommensurable with that. You know, they couldn't give a damn about wealthy wealth and fame. It's not natural. It's a construct of the ego. I think it's very reasonable to think that the unconscious can rebel when the executive ego completely ignores it yeah it's it's very normal that it would start you know um turning around its hole and and, and becoming uncomfortable and 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 we would notice that so i think some dreams maybe many dreams really are meant to the ego it's the way your mind communicates to itself and it doesn't do that in language because only one part of your mind is capable of language that's the modern philo phylogenetically recent uh, ego, the neocortex, uh, the more atavistic, ancient mind, which is very emotion, feeling driven, it's instinctive, does not have access to your broadcast area. It doesn't speak language. Yeah. It doesn't communicate that way. It has to communicate directly through meaning and body uh, experiential states that then trigger the ego to construct a symbolic narrative around it so the ego can tell itself what it is that it has just felt or understood. And we call that a dream. Now, I can, uh, in other cases, if you are well aligned with your unconscious mind, with your diamond, which is the yeah. word I, mm -hmm. I, I like to use, Yeah. yeah. usually that comes only with maturity. When I was young, I, I didn't have a clue. Um, but with maturity, 
it's very subtle. We don't even see it happening. But at some point, you look back and you think, oh, I have been living in much more accord with my real self than with my adaptive self, the ego and the ego's stories about what life is all about and what it wants, as opposed to what you really want deep inside you. Um, and then there is less need for the unconscious to scream at you uh, or to send you an urgent message. Um, it can, it, it's freed to do its thing. And then the character of dreams does change. At, at least that's my personal experience. Oh, yeah. I can, I can I mean, only speak to my personal experience. Practical example, I quit my day job about a year ago and it was a source of enormous stress. I felt very just, it just felt very dissonant and not aligning with what I wanted to do. And I had this as my sort of oasis on the side. And I always knew I wanted to really throw myself into this and try to make something of this. Um, and toward the end, I, you know, I was working on a, it was a project based job, technical job, IT and network engineering and security and stuff. And it was just becoming so stressful and just getting down, sitting down to do the work was just it just felt like an enormous load and it would just translate into so much nighttime anxiety and sleeplessness and nightmares. And I mean, a year yeah, removed. Nightmares. That's yeah, a key word right. there, nightmares. And a year removed from that. Am I free of all life's problems? Absolutely not. But do I sleep a lot better? Fuck yes, I do. You know, I sleep so much better because at least now my problems are my problems and they're the problems that I've chosen to to grapple with and those you know as little as something like doing this may seem from the outside looking in it feels much more in tune with whatever that nebulous voice from the unconscious wants from but from me you see the case you just discussed is a pretty healthy one because you say i was stressed i was frustrated i was anxious when you say i it's your ego yes so the ego was in line with the unconscious. Those two layers were stressed. Uh, so even if the unconscious sent some nightmares your way, it's not a serious situation because at the, the egoic level, you're already aware of the inadequacy of your life as mm -hmm. it was compared to where you really, really deeply wanted to go. Dreams are much more important when you talk to someone who says, are you happy with your job? And the person says, totally happy with my job. It's exactly where I, where I want it to be, exact, exactly what I want to do. And then this person goes home and has a terrible nightmare at night and wakes up sweating and then convinces himself again, no, 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 I'm going to do the work I chose. That's, that's where my life is going. Next night, another funny dream that entails stress, anxiety, something is inappropriate. That is the compensation. It's when the attitude of the ego is different and, 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 and contradictory with uh, the attitude of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. That was not your case. Both layers were unhappy. Dreams are much more important when the ego thinks everything's okay. Yeah, yeah. When it's not. When the ego thinks, oh, I want to be rich and famous and I am on my way to get rich and famous. And your dreams are crucifying you every night. That's the moment to pay attention. Not where you were. You were already at the end of the process. You're you were right. already, you know, co cognitive of where you're going. And then there comes a point at, at later where you're fine with where you are, and your unconscious is fine with where you are. And then your dreams are no longer com compensatory. They tend to enrich things. Let me give you a concrete example. Be before I got to where I am when I was still very attached to, to the high-tech world, the corporate world, you know, I had founded a company and eventually was sold to Intel. And then I was doing technology strategy at ASML, a company that every now, everybody now has heard of, you know, the, the unique company that makes machines with which others make chips. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, and I thought, I'm I'm making my um, my life exactly as I wanted it to be when I was a teenager. I'm ticking every box. I have my own freestanding house, and you know, I have my wife, I have my cats, and uh, job and power and money. And um, and I was persistent. This was years ago, and I was persistently having a recurring nightmare, which Jung interpreted 
And I knew what the interpretation was. I mean, it's the same nightmare that Jung's patients had had. Yeah. Jung himself had that, that same nightmare. And I knew that and still I ignored it. I knew Jung. I knew the interpretation. I knew what it meant. And I continued to ignore it year after year, which is amazing how stupid you can be when you're oh, young, yeah. right? It's incredible. Um, and the dream was the following. I was in my house. And then I discovered that there was an entire huge other wing oh, yes, in my yes, house yes, yes, that yes, I yes. didn't know existed. You know, many other rooms, underground, uh, uh, in, 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 in basements and attics, and, and uh, all kinds of uh, beautiful furniture and paintings and strange equipment and, and laboratories, and room after room. And I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't know I had all this. I didn't know my house was so big and it was so exciting, so mysterious, so many things to discover. So it was not a nightmare. The unconscious was not punishing me, but it was giving me a compensatory message. I thought my life was what it was and that's what it needed to be. And the unconscious was telling me there is much more to you than you think there is. The house of your mind, the house of your psyche has rooms you've never explored. You don't even know they exist. There is equipment there for you to do experiments you never thought possible. And you got to explore those other rooms. And how did that message come to me? Not in the words, you've got to explore it, but in the feeling, yeah. it's so exciting to explore yeah. it, you see? So the message is the feeling evoked, not a series of words or concepts. And um, it took me years to heed that. I would wake up, I had this dream. I know what it means. Okay, maybe I'll learn something next week. That's what I thought. Well, the message was, no, no. It's not that you're going to learn something next week. It's that ne next week you have to be more than you think you are. You are more than you think you are. Your life has horizons uh, that, that you haven't even discerned uh, yet. There is much more to be, much more to do. Than, than your present uh, focus. Today, many horizons in my life. Uh, I'm completely detached from a static sense of personal agency. Um, I don't have the dream anymore. Never. Wow. Never. Not once it occurs. For many years um, already. I still have one other recurring dream that I still know exactly what it is. And knowingly, I still refuse to do something about it. Mm. And, and that's maybe when I'm 60. But because the price is too high for the ego. Wow. I do not want to go. I, I know what the problem is. I know what I have to do. I know what the dream is saying. I have been having this dream for 20 years. I know what it's saying. It, every time it's an uncomfortable dream. I don't like it. But I don't like even more what I would have to do to be over with it. I, I have a I have an intuitive thing that I think you're getting to. However, one, I want to say you have no idea how much I relate to that finding secret rooms in the house dream. That that's hugely just, just that that was a hugely important dream for me as well. Like I had that as a young child. Like I would and and this is really one of those almost like demonic transmissions because as a kid, you have no idea what this is about. Like you take it absolutely literally you, you in the next morning, you go to the basement and you try to see if there's a secret room. But then as you go through life, you start to realize that this is like, this is like the labyrinth of the self. This is the labyrinth of the psyche. This is you trying to circumambulate that capital S self and figure out who you are at the deepest essence. And you just don't have the necessary vessel to even begin to download that message as a kid or as a young man. And I don't even think I have the ability to do it now by any means. Like I, maybe I see the outline of it, but I don't get what it really means to be in that pulsating center, you know? And yeah, it's, I don't know if we can leave this on a better, more uh, meta note that everybody can sort of relate to uh, than, than that. I mean, that's a big one. That's a really big one. You know, one of the biggest risks we have, and I know it because I stepped on that mine myself, one of the biggest risks 
from one perspective, it's a big risk. From another perspective, it's a blessing. I, I will elaborate on both. Is when you succeed as a young adult in realizing the plans you had when you were a teenager. That's a blessing and a curse. And and whether which one it is depends on your attitude towards it. It can be a, a, a curse in the following way. You had an idea of self when you were a teenager. You sort of had an idea about who you wanted to be and you wanted to be respected as that person you wanted to be. You wanted to be successful as that person you wanted to be. And then by the time you were 35, let's suppose you succeed in being what you wanted to be when you were a teenager. And you are respected. And you are comfortable. And you have proven yourself as that already. So you get comfortable. You will resist becoming something else. Yeah. Right. Because the moment you try to stretch out your horizon and become something else, oh gosh, here we go again. You have to prove yourself again. You had to deal with danger and uncertainty uh, again. Um, and we don't want. We think that, you know, 35, I've suffered enough. I paid my dues. I'm respected as what I am. So I will remain what I am until the rest of my life. And that is the definition of how wasted life. Yeah. It is the very definition of wasting your life because we are dynamic things. We are verbs. Uh, we, we, life is not about arriving at a point and then enjoying. <laughs> That's not what nature is trying to do through us. So in that sense, it's a curse. But it can be a blessing because um, if you have the attitude, the right attitude, because once you, as a young adult, you succeed in the dreams you had when you were a teenager, you've become the fighter pilot you wanted to be, <laughs> which is what I wanted to be when I was a kid, before I wanted to be a scientist and a high-tech executive, which I became. You achieve that dream. And if your character is put together in a certain way, what that will lead you to realize is that the dream was an illusion. It didn't make you happy. Um, and then you die. Um, and that's the blessing. <laughs> It, it's when you die because the ghost has only has power on you if you're trying to catch it. Mm. Because for as long as you're still trying to catch it, you think it's real. But when you finally catch it, your hands just, just go through it and you realize it's a ghost. It's a mirage. Yeah. It wasn't real. It didn't do what I wanted it to do. I thought it would make me completely happy and, and content and satisfied. And, and it, it, it didn't do the thing. It didn't do it. So it was an illusion. And so catching that ghost is a blessing because it destroys your illusion. Now, in my case, I went through over 10 years of miserable psychological suffering mm. um, because I had to die to myself. Um, those things defined me and my life and suddenly they were not there anymore. There was a great vacuum and I had to gestate something else uh, in order to find peace again. And that, that took over 10 years and, and it gave me 10 books. Yeah. Each book it was a product of suffering and a product of that sort of realignment uh, with life. But that was the blessing because my attitude was the attitude of, it doesn't matter that I am comfortable now. I'm not happy. And that made me die. And as a teenager, I thought I'm going to die early, so I have to be in a hurry. So I oh, went wow. to computer engineering school. I was 17. By the time I was 22, I had a master's degree. By the time I was 26, I had one doctorate already at 26. So everything happened very, very, very fast. My dream job was my first job at CERN because something in my mind, very much in the back of my mind, was telling me, you're going to die by the time you're 35. And sure enough, I did. Mm. <laughs> Not in the way I thought I would, um, but I did. Anyway, talked so much. <laughs> Bernardo, this is easily my favorite conversation we've had. We're, we're, we're way more kindred spirits than I even thought we were. I thought we had some philosophical overlap. Always thought you were brilliant, but we have way more, way more overlap than I even <laughs> knew. So I really, really enjoyed this. I know you said you're not doing nearly as many interviews this year, but... Hopefully we can talk again sometime. 
Um, is there is there anything actively that you want to point people toward, or should I just point people toward the website, the foundation? Um, I have a new book coming out in October of 2024. It's called Analytic Idealism in a Nutshell. And in a sense, it's it, it's a closure and a new beginning. I want to put out my definitive, summarized, to the point, no-nonsense articulation of analytic idealism based on the gazillions of times I have had to explain right. it over the past 15 years. So, so collecting all I learned from having to explain it to multiple different people with multiple different perspectives and backgrounds, I sort of, sort of try to consolidate all that in a short, direct exposition and, and, and defense, substantiation of analytic idealism. And that closes my recurring attempt to explain it. So it's the closing document. This is it. If people ask me, what's analytic idealism? Here's the book. Yeah. Read it. It's short, less than 200 pages. You can read it in one sitting. I have a friend who a couple of days ago sent me an email and said, I read it in one sitting. It's fast paced. It's not boring. I don't use a single word more than I need to Beautiful. <laughs> to convey the idea very clearly and explicitly. No hand waving, no smoke and mirrors, no erudition and difficult language, none of that. So if people are interested in it, have a look at that book. And um, it also marks the opening of a new phase. But I'm not going to talk about <laughs> it yet. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to the new phase and to the book. Maybe you can maybe you can do one of your final explanations uh, if you feel up for it once the book comes out uh, on the show again, if you feel like it. Oh, Either sure. way, when the book comes out. When the book comes out, I will be doing the obligatory promotion promotional interview rounds. Uh, uh, until then, probably less. But then I will I will come back and I will talk about the book, and that will be the ritual closing of that phase. And then I want to take analytic idealism forward with more true research and more and this time more scientifically oriented uh, work mm. to give continuity to the thing that's what i plan to do i ha i'm having this intermezzo with the uap phenomenon yeah uh, i sort of fell into that hole not entirely through my own fault uh, over the past few months i'm bringing that to a closure with that essay i probably will stay on the sidelines of the field but it's not a field i want to yeah. plunge in too deeply because it's a very strange area of human activity. It really is. I'm not entirely comfortable with yeah. what I have seen uh, there, if you know what I mean. The, the oh, human no, I, I, I completely understand. There was somebody I wanted to ask you about, actually, that I'm like, oh, maybe I don't, maybe he doesn't want to comment on that. But yeah. Oh, you can ask anything you want. If I don't want to comment, I'll tell you. I don't want to comment on it. Do we want to open this can of worms at this point or should... It if you if you like, it's okay. Uh, we still have at least uh, fifteen minutes until the top of the well, hour. So. When we were when we were talking about you know the sort of limitate potential limitations of the dashboard and the way that we acquire information empirically, and if there's some kind of limit there, and if we have to start looking at other ways of explaining things and making sense of things, you know, this brings up people like um, like a. Diana Pasolka, or more exotically, like a Chris Bledsoe. And I was curious, I was curious what you think of, of him, because he's one of those people who ha has become very popular, but he's also got these incredibly outlandish stories of contact and of phenomena. And um, yeah, I, I don't know what to, Chris, you said, I think it's I think it's Chris Bledsoe. Yeah, he. Oh, are you? I, I don't okay. Know. Well, I'll have to send you some things, and and you'll have to you'll have to let me know um, if you. If I know you... the name Diana, but I haven't read um, her books. Okay, so she. I haven't read her books either. I've only seen a couple interviews, so I may be speaking out of turn here. But she comes. From... I haven't even seen her, oh, her okay. interviews. Okay. Uh, yeah. But but um, I, um, I read and talk to people I do respect who are involved in this feud. I can drop you a few names, um, Gary Nolan, yeah. um, um, uh, Jacques Vallée, who is a childhood hero of yeah, mine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a few other people I do respect. I do respect the journalist uh, Ross Coulthard. Yeah, me too. Um, I do respect Jamie Foxx. Um, the thing about this field 
and I'm not blaming the people. It, it, it's something about this field that does this to the human mind. Even some of the more serious investigators, and I'm, I, I don't mean by this any of the names I just mentioned, the people I just mentioned are, are, are not examples of people who embody the criticism I'm about to make. And even the criticism is not about the people, it's about the phenomenon. The phenomenon does this to people. Even people who are in any other context, competent, serious scholars, uh, straight thinking people guided by reason and evidence, there is something about this phenomenon. Uh, and I don't know what, because it has not had quite this effect on me, uh, but I see it having this effect in other serious, uh, competent people who become entangled with the phenomenon and somehow lose their grounding yeah. um, and fall victim to ungrounded thinking, um, even mental illness. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, so this is not a criticism to any one person. So this, w w again, everything I just said does not apply to the names I named. Does not apply to those people. And I am in a position to know it does not apply to those people. But it applies to others, I think, from my perspective. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, it's not only one person. You see it happening in, in, in sort of a community. Um, and it is strange, it is concerning, because you know that uh, in any other field, this would not have happened to those people. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. There is something about this phenomenon that ungrounds, seem to unground people. It, it, it has a strange, pernicious psychological effect in how people evaluate their relationship, not only with the phenomenon, but with reality at large. They go down rabbit holes that are beyond implausible and suddenly they become plausible or they start failing yeah. to be explicit and logical in what they are saying. They start articulating things in the form of riddles and whispers and suggestions. Uh, it, which is not how one should go about trying to clarify what's happening. You shouldn't go down this avenue of suggestive whispers and hand waving and mysteries. And, and it's like, well, wait, wait a moment, be, be clear, be direct, be consistent and conceptually clear in what you were saying. Let's follow the logic here. That does this imply? Uh, does this imply that? It doesn't. So why why are you drawing yeah. that conclusion? Why are you extrapolating things this way? And then oh no, but there is this and woo, 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 there is that. And I said, whoa, you you wouldn't expect people with that kind of um, you know intellectual ability, education, intelligence um, to start operating along those lines. Yeah, yeah. It sort of departs from a certain value system that is inculcated in us in academia from very early. We are supposed to speak explicitly, logically, and clearly about our lines of thinking and not appeal to mysteries and, and whispers and uh, extrapolations without logical or empirical ground and, and start believing in plausible lines and falling into a rabbit hole yeah. in which you, know, you, you open up all kinds of strange possibilities, Gnostic possibilities about the nature of reality and religion and science all becomes conflated together. And who knows? It's a great mystery. Anything is possible. It, it, the field does that. Yeah. For, and I, I, I've been in it for a very short time and I'm like, whoa, oh, and, and this is, what is this? this <laughs> now you're getting to what I was alluding to with like the real risk of the ontological shock. It's so much greater than most people think like, oh, we need to rethink our religions and our, and our science if this is real. It's like, no, you may lose yourself 
in the sea of possibilities that could be implied by allowing this new X onto your table of what you consider to be real. That could put that has a gravity well to it that leads to all these other possibilities that if you start to take those possibilities seriously, you're, you're going to be way out there and yeah. it's, and it's, I don't know what's real. I don't know where, where yeah. this thing ends, but I also know that you can't go so untethered the moment that you poke a hole in what you thought was real. There, there still has to be this, this discernment and this degree of rigor applied to everything. Um, yeah. yeah. Look, the fact that there is more to reality than we imagined before does not mean that we have to abandon everything we learned. And, and, and that seems to be partly what happens. Once you realize that this stuff is serious, there is a reality to this. This is not nonsense. Once you psychologically have that acceptance, that true sincere, honest acceptance, honest to yourself, you know there is more to what you thought there was in nature um, because this, there is a reality to this UAP phenomenon. When you accept, accept that, that acceptance seems to gather a momentum that surreptitiously stimulates you to start abandoning, abandoning yes. the solid ground of everything that you've learned and you know is true so far or everything you have very good reasons to still think is true. So you start abandoning all of that ground under your feet, that solid ground of our epistemology or of our evolving understanding of nature and reality. You start abandoning the idea of an objective world beyond our individual mind. You stop abandoning the idea that there is such a thing as the regularities we call the laws of physics and start abandoning the notion that even though logic is arbitrary, it does have empirical applications. It, it, it does work. So we don't need to abandon it completely. Uh, or that um, observation of ordinary phenomena do not become invalid when you observe an extraordinary one. You still have the observations of the ordinary that you have no reason to think no longer apply. They do still apply. You see, so it's like pricking a hole in a, in a party balloon that you filled with water. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, the hole bursts the balloon. Well, in fact, you just prick a hole that you can look through, uh, but you compartmentalize that. You, yeah. you set a, a little room in your mind uh, with a little plaque on the door saying unsolved mystery. Right. But that's one room in the palace of your mind. You don't go wreak havoc in all the other rooms because the other rooms are the instruments and the foundations you need in order to eventually solve the currently unsolved mysteries. If you abandon all that, you're in free fall. You don't know what you're saying. You just spout out nonsensical uh, stuff. I think this has something to do with our repressed religious impulse. We have always, as a species, as a civilized species with a culture, and a cultural narrative about what's going on, we have always lived in the presence of a mystery. And, th and that mystery was encoded in what we call religion, the gods, the unseen yeah. forces that uh, rule our lives, that uh, govern the, the, the movements of nature. Um, and there is something fundamentally natural about living in the presence of the mystery. Yeah. Even for us, we are monkeys. Monkeys are not in the business of finding out the ultimate truths. Right, so when we lost religion, and we lost religion around you know the time of Nietzsche, the second half of the, of the 19th century, only then did we really, really lose religion in the sense that we stopped really, really believing. Uh, religion became a sort of separate aspect of reality, as opposed to the truth of reality. <laughs> um, when we lost that, we lost our relationship to mystery, and there is something profoundly unnatural about that. And when the mystery opens up again on a solid basis, like, you know, there are radar traces and infrared images of these things yeah. up in the sky, and they do things that contradict the laws of physics. Um, oh, the mystery is back. Yeah. And, and, and all of that repressed uh, relationship with the mystery yeah. for the past 150 years 
it bursts the balloon. Yeah. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yes. The moment you prick a hole and you allow it the legitimacy to exist, it flows out and bursts the balloon. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. Yeah. That is dangerous not only for the person who who succumbs to that, but it's dangerous for the culture who will read the books this person writes from a position of authority. It's incredibly dangerous. Now, but but uh, to be honest, Michael, um, I've been in this arena uh, very short. I mean, I have always had interest in the phenomenon, but being more directly involved as, a, as I have been the past few months, uh, it has been very short. Uh, I, the, the, the main conclusion for me is that these people that I think succumb to this process are just people like me. So I have no reason to think that I couldn't succumb to that. Yeah. And I actually, through introspection, I realized that I, I began to succumb to that. I, I, I started taking one particular line of speculation that I regret. I already removed it from the draft essay I'm writing. Um, a friend of mine said, uh, this this last part of your essay, it's like, it doesn't belong there. Why are you talking about this? And then another person from the field, one of the people I trust, uh, he, he read the essay and sent me back an email and what he said, what is up with that final section? <laughs> what, what, what is that business? <laughs> and I was like, shit, I am beginning to succumb to that. Mm. There is a trickster lose in this phenomenon. Can can and, you can um, you give us a little taste of of what you abandoned? Because you're saying you've abandoned it, so at least you're you're giving yourself a no. Okay, okay. <laughs> had to try. I had to try because I I, I re already removed that from the essay. There are only a couple of editors in the world now that have the original. Unfortunately, I cannot delete it from their mailboxes. Um, if it ever comes out, I will own it. But at the same time, I would say, I don't think like that anymore. That was a brief lapse <laughs> of my criteria for truth. And I went too far in my speculation. Make no mistake, it may be true what I was saying. I would even go as far as to say it probably is. But wow. I'm not in a position to be able to substantiate it and defend it enough for it to be published. And it's irresponsible. Even thinking, as I do, that it's probably true, it is. it would do a disservice to the rest of my work if I came out with it with the thin basis I have for it today. So I would not come out with it. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it is, otherwise wow. it would defeat the purpose of the whole thing. But um, just to conclude, this made me want to leave the few. Mm. That's and fair. Yeah, that's fair. I don't want to disappear in that black hole. Um, I, I've seen others disappear in that black hole, people who are just like me. So I'm, I, I have no reason to think I'm any less vulnerable to it than they were. And then it started happening to me. It, it was just like a two hour period in which I thought I'm going to add it to the essay. And I did add it and I did send it out two hours. And then I came back to my yeah <laughs> to my reasonable self <laughs> well anybody who I, i'm assuming like anybody who's been around the block of this unless you're proposing something totally novel that no one's ever talked about before you can sort of probably chalk it up to a few possibilities and knowing that those possibilities are there is enough to understand how they have this sort of seductive gravity that can start to pull you into it and pretty soon you find yourself, you know, you talk about something once and suddenly you're an expounder of this idea and people ask you about it over and over again and you're talking about it over and over again. So now suddenly you are synonymous with this idea and you're not even sure if you believe that idea, but you're the one on podcasts and soon you're talking, you're, you've told hundreds of thousands of people about a, a potentially dubious idea. So I definitely respect that. Look, this, what you just said is okay for a journalist. Yeah. It's not okay for an academic or a theoretician writing on, on the subject. You have to have more stringent criteria about the minimum level of substantiation you have to have before you 
promulgate a certain yeah. idea, even if it's just a hypothesis. You cannot pollute the airwaves with ungrounded hypotheses all over the place. It does not help. Um, I was briefly in a group of people working on this phenomenon, and somebody posted the, a taxonomy of all the hypotheses. Yeah. And I kid you not, there were a couple of hundred of hypotheses organized in an incredibly complex uh, a graph wow. or, uh, with how everything could possibly be linked. And when I looked at that, I thought, okay, this, this isn't a, a black hole without a bottom. Yeah. Now, this does not help. It does not help to catalog every conceivable possibility. Um, it just increases the chance that you burst the balloon when you prick a hole in it. Because then, you know... Uh, no, it's 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 a very strange, psychologically very dangerous field of human activity, and I and I don't even blame the humans. The nature of the phenomenon seems to stimulate <clears throat> this, and it has an, it had an, an undesirable effect on me. A small one, I caught it in time, <coughs> but I have seen it enough, even in myself, that I'm like, okay, no. I'm going to do neuroscience now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's important to that reminds me even yeah. even Jung, like the the reason he took up building <laughs> Bollinger Tower is because he felt like he had gone so far into the realm of archetypes and you know go, gone so deep into the psyche that he needed something to ground himself in, like tactile grounding. This block goes on top of this block and it's concrete reality because if you don't have those things to balance you out you're going to go untethered. I mean, it's well known that he considers what happened to him in the years he wrote the Red Book to be on the very brink of psychosis and that he went right up to the edge. And the only thing that kept him was his ability to translate it into art and his ability to use all of the tools at his disposal intellectually, psychologically to, to keep him sort of at the center of the of the currents rather than being swept up in them so i yeah. yeah it can absolutely does not matter how brilliant you are doesn't matter what you know how smart you are you encounter these big things and you can absolutely get swept up in them so i the I trickster understand. is yes the trickster is loose in this field it's powerful and it's completely loose it has no restraints it wreaks havoc with otherwise sound uh, human minds to, to a greater or lesser degree. Um, but yeah, it's a pity because it's an area I am interested in. I think there are discoveries to be made, at least acknowledgements to be issued. Um, I just don't see that it's the best use of my, of my yeah. time and this short life I have. I think it's more promising to look into further elaboration of analytic idealism under the formalisms of uh, integrated information theory, which is <coughs> what I want to do. Um, and I, was, I, I will keep one toe in the UAP field because you never know what's going yeah. to come out. If more acknowledged, solid, reliable data comes out, then you have solid grounds to continue to speculate in a grounded, educated manner. But you cannot have a career speculating on a tiny amount of vague and uh, dubious uh, data. Yeah, it's not enough input to feed grounded, educated speculation for more than an essay or maybe a book. Uh, so there is no point in continuing that. If more data comes out, data that is reliable and acknowledged, then I probably go back in and okay, okay, now there's more to work with. But short of that, to keep entertaining hypothesis making, speculation, <coughs> imagination, even if it is to some degree educated, just pollutes the airwaves and contributes to a further untethering of uh, of the cultural narrative around these things. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for taking me through that and and drawing a little more of an outline around that because I was definitely curious. I still have you've still evoked more questions, but I won't I won't push you on them. Um, and we're and we're coming up right on the three hour mark anyway. So this has been an absolute, just tremendous mind meld. Thanks for doing it. And uh, 
Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Of course, of course. <laughs>